You want to sit over here? That's fine. Yeah. There's an additional charge for that. Six one five eight. Um, before we get started, there's a couple of things. Uh, look, it appears that everyone has signed in on the sheet on the side. When you exit the building, make sure that you exit the same door that you came in. Don't don't go out these doors so that you can turn your ID badges in. Um, uh, that that's wrong. That's an error. Yeah, that's an error. Um, one of the things that I wanted to say, uh, I see that the um, there, there are only four members here today instead of five. And two members had conflicts of interest, they thought, uh, with an attorney that would be representing uh, the people with the wedding venue. Obviously, he's not here. 
So I just wanted to put that out there. That's why there's four members. There's not five. Uh, the other two thought they had, uh, felt as if they had a conflict of interest uh, with who they thought was going to be the attorney today. So I'm assuming you mean Mr. Bauhoff. Yes. So he may show up. I was going to say as part of my sort of preliminaries that Mr. Bauhoff has uh, criminal hearings in both district and circuit across the street, and that once okay. those are done, he, he may okay. show up. So I, did, I, did, I just wanted to be perfectly clear. That's why we have four. It was not a dereliction of duties on their part. It was actually... Um, uh, they, they felt as if they needed to recuse themselves. May, I just want to make clear, one of your regular sitting members is unavailable. Yes. And the, the other, alternate is also unavailable as a result of Okay. They, they felt as if there was a conflict of interest. Understood. Okay. And with the original case, there's only one guy here that was in on the original case. He will be the focus of our uh, Oh, he will be the focus. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank you. With, with that, with, with all those housekeeping details out of the way, um, Mr. Dixon, would you go ahead and introduce the file for us, please? All right. Case 6158, a remand from circuit court for an appeal of a site plan approval that is not consistent with the decision of BZA case 5822. The site is located at 817. Frittinger Mill Road, Westminster, Maryland, on Property Zone A, Agricultural District and Election District 6. By Stephen and Jacqueline Hicks, Code of Public Local Laws and Ordinances, Section 158.070 ET. A site visit is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, April 20th, 2022, at approximately 9.30 a.m. Okay. So, in the file of this matter, we have the following uh, documents. Notice of public hearing, March 17th, board's decision and remanded case from a circuit court judge Maria L. Ostriker dated March 4th 2022 there's the unreported uh, decision from the court of special appeals is the decision from the BZA that was uh, issued July 30th, 2019, signed by Melvin E. Bale, Jr., Chairman. There is a decision uh, about the Royer House LLC uh, based on a hearing held March 24, 2015, and it was signed March 27, 2015. Ask that the file be entered into evidence. We have a motion to enter the file into evidence. So moved. moved. Second. Okay. It's been moved and seconded to move the file into evidence. All in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. We will move the file into evidence. Um, one other thing I failed to mention uh, before we started the hearing if you have any electronic devices, please put them on silence. 
so it doesn't interrupt the proceedings here today. Uh, if you plan on testifying here today, could you please stand and take the oath? Could you raise your right, right hand, please? Do you swear or affirm under penalties of perjury that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Okay, thank you. You may be seated. Uh, before you address the board, uh, please state your name, address, and occupation, and spell for the record your last name. Um, Mr. Bowersox, uh, you're the, I'm assuming you're the, repre you're the uh, legal representation for the appellant? I am. Okay, so we'll go ahead and use our normal format. Since you're the appellant, you'll go first. Uh, you'll present your case and call witnesses, and then the, uh, the uh, opposition can do the very same, and then there will be the opportunity for summation uh, comments by both sides along with a rebuttal from you, and then we'll go ahead and, and uh, decide the case. Thank you. Uh, let me just make one uh, um, representation, and that is that the board has, at this time, all the board members have either looked at the video from uh, the transcript or read the transcript, one or the other. Okay. From, from 2015. 2000, right. March 2015. Yes. yes. The one that you provided to me, yes. I gave to them, so they've either read the transcript or gone and seen the video. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Bowersox. Good morning. Uh, David K. Bowersox, B-O-W-E-R-S-O-X, 24 North Court Street. I'm here on behalf of the appellants, uh, Stephen and Jacqueline Hicks, who are seated to my right. Um, this is essentially, if I can begin by making some prefatory remarks, this is a remand from the Court of Special Appeals that essentially continues the hearing that began in July, or, uh, I believe, of 2019 in this case. Uh, the decision Mr. Dixon has identified having been issued July 30th, 2019, and is part of the record in this case. When the matter went to the Court of Appeal, the Court of Special Appeals, it was remanded back. There were a couple of points that I'll make about the remand. Um, one thing that the Court of Special Appeals said at pages 19, page 19, was that the 2015 transcript of the hearing should have been included as part of the record. I will take care of that as a housekeeping matter this morning. Um, and the other thing the court remarked about, one of the other things that is, I think, pertinent for us moving forward, is the board should include the entire record of the proceeding, including the transcript. And I'm at page 20 of the court's unreported opinion. Uh, and a reminder that the board must explain its reasoning and factual bases. A conclusory statement without explanation is legally insufficient. I mention that only because I'm going to rely on the factual bases you have expressed in your decision from 2015 in case 5822, um, and I will present evidence of what I'm referring to there. Um, what I'm also going to do, and Mr. Dixon, would I know you said the opinion's in the file. Do you want me to introduce it as an exhibit? You can. This is one.
Give me one piece as a balance one. Okay. Here is an extra copy if you'd want. Thank you. Just leave it here. I'll just leave it there. <coughs> <coughs> Just for the record, there's no objection to appellants one. Thank okay, you. Very good. And we will accept that into evidence. It's already in the file, is that? Yes, it is. I just, I didn't know if it formally. We'll, we'll still accept it into evidence. It's okay. um, the next thing I have will be, I suppose, number two. Two, this is the original transcribed testimony from March 24, 2015, in case 5A22. You, you want to move that into evidence? Yes, in light of what the court's order said. Okay. No objection to appellants, too. We will accept that into evidence. Was it already was it already in the file, Mr. Bowersox? I don't know that it was. Okay, very good. But I didn't see it in the original. Okay, so we'll we'll move. We'll, it's part of the record now. We'll move it into evidence. And finally, I'd like to offer as number three. This is your record from case five eight two two. The copy of the paper file record. ask the, the board for a little bit of indulgence here. This is the first time I'm just going to flip through and... Absolutely. Smells is all over the place.
those pictures. These pictures were introduced in the original. Pardon me? These pictures were introduced. In the yes, original. I presume that's. The application. I wasn't there. I presume well, I that's what there. they were. I there. But I'm assuming so. so I've seen yeah, the file as well. Which represented to me as the scanned version of their file. Right. Okay. Uh, no objection to. It's going to be appellants three. Three. Okay, we will go ahead and move that into evidence. And, and for the record, could you identify yourself? Yes, um, Andrew Kiphart. Kiphart is spelled K-I-P-H-A-R-T of Bauhoff and Buchholz LLC on behalf of um, Royer House LLC, which is now the Christian Royer House LLC, and seated next to me are the owners. Um, w. Bradley Bauhoff may also show up at some point, in which case you will scoot in here to, to represent the the opposition, as you put it, as well. Okay, very good. Thank you. And we, we, we've uh, entered that into evidence without objection. Okay, Mr. Bowersox. Having gone through all that, what, what is the issue before us here? What did, the, what did the Court of Special Appeals remand back to you for additional proceedings? It's the appellant's request or application before you appealing the decision of the Bureau of Development Reviews, approval of a simplified site plan from April 26, 2019. It was the site plan that was used, or intended, let's say, to implement the decision of the board, your predecessors, in case 5822 the decision that was mentioned by Mr. Dixon as being um, issued in March of 2015. So the basis of the challenge to the, zone, the um, Bureau of Development Review is that there are substantial differences between the evidence presented to the board and in the application upon which your decision was made in case 5822 and the actual site plan that was approved for the use approved by Mr. Black for the Bureau of Development Review on April 26, 2019. The basis for this is code section 158.1337. It specifically provides that where evidence is presented about site plans, construction plans, any development on the site, in the application, and other plans, other plans are developed for the realization of the use, if they are substantially different from what was before the board, the, the board must approve those changes. That's what we're dealing with here. We are not, we are not challenging the board's initial decision in case 5822. This is not an end run appeal as it was characterized in 2019. Nothing at all like that. Frankly, if what was actually developed and reflected in the site plan, if that was the, if the approved site plan reflected what this board had before it in 2015, we wouldn't be here. It doesn't. The situation is one where you see it sometimes when an applicant will come before you, having the benefit on the property of a conditional use, wants to make some modifications of that use. It could be the same kind of a use. I can think of a contractor's equipment storage facility that I brought before you a couple of years ago, a few years ago where something's changed, either the scope of the size 
hours of operation. Something else is different than what was presented to you in the original case. The applicant came back to get the board's approval for the modification of the conditional use, which is going to be reflected in the new site plan. Because it was different than what was there. And the applicant wanted to make sure he wasn't facing the attacks from some of the neighbors under the same kind of basis that's being raised now. They wanted to make sure they only built out and operated within the confines of what you had heard about and had approved. That's what this case is about. It's why the record of the case, it's why the, the transcript of the testimony, and that's why the simplified site plan that was approved in 2019 are all highly relevant to this matter. I want to look at um, this mouse has a mind of its own. I'm sorry. I'm hoping we're going to look at this. It's a double click. Yep. It's unavailable. So maybe we need to get Matt out here. I broke it already. Okay, thank you. This is a copy of, I believe, Exhibit 3. This is a digital copy of Exhibit 3. Um, at the 65th and 66 pages, of this record, you will find come on. You have to click outside of the text box. Yeah. Sensitive, isn't it? <laughs> Matt, could you set the sensitivity different on that I mouse? Have tried it. Every okay. 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 Uh, click the I got to get there. Well, the other thing is hit that now. Okay. Settings on the This is at page 65 and 66 of the original application for 2015. These are the drawings that were submitted in support of the application at that time of what the intended layout of the property was. It's very simple, um, not a lot of detail. At page 66, there's something with a little more detail. Maybe I can This is a, a little more detail of the layout of the site. In the application that was submitted in 2015, this is what the application showed. That's all. If you'd like, for illustration, I have paper copies I can distribute to you. Yes, please. <clears throat> I 
Actually, for the sake of making things clean, I'd introduce this as number four. Yes. Now, the application that was made was for a conditional use. It was a conditional use for a country inn in the agricultural zone. It's an authorized use in the agricultural zone. It references the regulations for country inns in section 158.071 of the zoning code, which is the conservation zone. It borrows the elements for a country in from the conservation zone use. There was also a request for an event facility, for a wedding facility catering facility. That section of the code, 158.071, indicates that that's a possible extra use for a country in as an accessory use. What is an accessory use? Zent versus Carroll County tells us that an accessory use is a use that is customary, incident, or incidental, and subordinate to the primary use of the property. And, and some of you have heard me say this before, it's the tail, not the dog. When the tail starts wagging the dog, when the alleged accessory use becomes the dominant use on the site, it's no longer an accessory use allowed under the code. I'd like to offer for number five. And I apologize for the size and scale you've got here with this. This is a copy of the approved simplified site plan for this use from 2019, April 26, 2019. objection to appellants five okay we'll accept those and I, I forgot to say that we would accept the, the previous uh, in, into evidence why don't I just make a motion to blanketly move all five in if yeah. they're not we'll, 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 we'll accept those as evidence Okay, here is the simplified site plan that was approved in April 26, 2019 by Clayton Black, former uh, chief of the Bureau of Development Review. Now, Initially, you can see greater detail on this.
than on this. And we will explain why some of those differences are substantial differences between the decision in case 5822 and what's reflected on here. This is number six, and again, for the sake of intended simplicity, here's a copy of the decision of this board. In case 5822. Thank you. I'll share with Dick. Short meal left. I'll share with Dick. He's getting the number. He's getting enough copy. Okay. And what are we labeling this, Mr. Bowers? Six. Thank you. We will accept this into evidence without objection. No objection. So you have before you the record of case 5822, the simplified site plan, which is relevant to this as um, being substantially different than what was approved. Um, you have the transcript in evidence before you. Let's look first at number six. Remember what we talked about initially that the Court of Special Appeals mentioned that the findings of fact are important. That's got to be the basis for the decision that you made. Most of the pertinent findings are on page one or I should say the first, first page. They're not numbered, I don't believe. I saw that. Last paragraph. Since, law act since the law required that someone actually live on the property, Alexandra and her husband intend to live in the log cabin. That's a finding based on the evidence from 2015. Not the Hicks evidence, the applicant's evidence. Wedding season would run from approximately May to October. <coughs> Most of the weddings occurring there initially would be outside. Then they would move, and there's testimony that they'd ultimately uh, incorporate inside weddings. The company would allow day weddings from noon to five, and the five rooms are available for rent. That's basically most of the factual findings other than the findings of fact personal, if I can use that term, to the witnesses, who they are, what they are, what's their relationship to the project. And you conclude in the last paragraph, full paragraph above the signature on the second page, based on the findings of fact made by the board above, the board found that the proposed project would not generate adverse effects.
All right, I have before you the transcript. It was introduced earlier. I believe it was number, was it number one or number two? Page 13. Oh my God, had I known it was going to be this difficult, I'd use the old fashioned way. At page 13, there is a question that was asked by counsel for the applicants in that case about whether they recognize it as a country inn. They'd have to have the owner, well, you can see the question. Um, there's, you realize that this variance, somebody's going to have to live on the property, is that correct? Yes. Um, Alex and Zach Campbell would be living in the log cabin on the grounds and they'd be the caretakers as well. On 15, asked about the wedding season when is that going to be anticipated may to early october On page 20, Chairman, uh, Member Tegler asked what about the hours of operations. And the testimony was, as you can see there, noon into the four or five o'clock range. If they want to do a reception there, then it would be after the wedding. But we wouldn't plan on being late into the evening. On the following page, there's additional questioning. Excuse me. From member Kramer, you're going to have somebody live on the premises. Correct. In the big house or small house, there's a log cabin. Again. Page 23. When asked about the number of people attending, 
how many people are you able to serve in your country and, and, and will any one particular function? In the inside, up to 100. I will submit that that is the only reference in the record, in the transcript, to a maximum number of people anticipated to attend. I'm not going to take you through every sentence to show you that there's nothing else. Twenty-six hours of operations may change. In what direction? So your hours of actual operation could change because if you're going to have a wedding at noon, your caterer will probably be there setting up around nine o'clock. Yes, that's true. A change in hours of operation to earlier than had been, and a possibility, granted of earlier than had previously been testified to. Simplified site plan. Number of, of events Click the what? The hand. Okay. Number of events under trip generation data, 20. The event times, April 26th, October 21st, 4 to 10 p.m. Does that appear anywhere in the record? or in the transcript. It does not. Proposed 49 by 82 foot tent. There was no testimony about a tent, a 49 by 82 foot tent, during the 2015 hearings as part of the improvements that were going to be instituted to realize the use that we were being asked to grant. There was none. There's nothing in the record. Remember, these are the plans that were submitted. We have a gazebo. We have pine trees. Parking to take place along the lane. Site plan shows country and parking spaces. There are five of them. There's also three handicapped spaces out here. There's nothing shown here about the parking along the lane. 
There's additional parking area shown as grass parking area, presumed to show the area for parking of the accessory use. Remember, an accessory use is customarily subordinate and incidental to the main use. There's a whole lot more than five parking spots there. When we get to the notes, General note B, country and subject to the following conditions. B, unless owner occupied, the manager must reside on the premises. Total disturbed area, 49.98 square feet. Curiously, two square feet below the 5,000 square foot area of disturbance, that would push them into full-blown site plan review. And remember, Access to the Michonne is a grass access drive on, I believe that would be the northwest end of the property, if I'm not mistaken, and also grass access drive on the southeast side of the property, or south side of the property, to the grass parking area, grass parking, grass access drive. another feature and if I've already done this one I apologize called your attention to it I mean maximum occupancy 200 people as compared to the 100 being the only number that they mentioned during the hearing. I take that back. There was also a reference in the transcript, you'll see it, when they discuss parking requirements and an example was thrown out of maybe 75 people attending a wedding. They are not all going to drive, so they're not going to need 75 parking spaces. I'd like to call my first witness. Go ahead. Jacqueline Hicks. Mrs. Hicks, have you been sworn? Yes. Right. Mrs. Hicks, um, state your name and your address for the record. Uh, Jacqueline Hicks, last name is spelled H-I-C-K-S, and my address is 984 Beggs Road in Westminster, 21157. All right. What's your relationship to the property we're discussing today? I believe I'm the closest um, okay. neighbor. 
Can you describe where you live? Uh, it's a very rural setting next to preserved farmland um, and very peaceful and just a, was a wonderful place to live. All right, I'm gonna show you um, some of the plans, the first page of the plans that we looked at um, that were associated with the original application. And do you see within the diagram shown, there is a large, there is a block, a polygonal block with arrows coming off of it. Is that the site to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And it, to move it along, the 605 foot arrow, does that run from the site to your home? Yes. Okay. So you are the closest adjoining neighbor, it appears. It appears, yes. All right. You've been here all morning? Yes. And you heard the, um, the presentation of the documentation, is that correct? Correct. All right. Um, the number of, event, of events shown on the site plan indicates 20. Is that consistent with your experience? Yes, I don't know exactly, but it, in that neighborhood for sure, sometimes more, okay. I think. And were you present in 2015 I was. at the hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals in case 5822? <coughs> I was. And you testified in that hearing, is that correct? I did. Okay. During that hearing, is, what is your recollection of the total maximum occupancy during an event? 175 to 100. All right. And what is your recollection of the times of the events? Noon to 5. Do you have any recollection of um, how frequent the events would be? Um, maybe a wedding a weekend, but that was really all that was talked about. Do you recall any testimony from 2015 about the proposed 49 foot by 82 foot tent Absolutely. that we discussed? Absolutely not. Or that is shown on the site plan? No. And when I say the site plan, the simplified site plan approved April 26, 2019. None? No. From your recollection of the testimony, how were these events to be conducted and where? It was my understanding that they were going to allow people to get married there and then they would held any receptions inside the main house and based on the testimony went on to describe that the first floor was perfectly suited as it could be completely opened up and hold up to 100 people. Okay. The site plan shows grass access drives yes. along the um, along the edge. Let's just say closest to your property. Yes. The boundary line there, and also um, ab above that, as you can see on the along near the other side of the property and by the existing house as shown on the um, site plan. Are they, are they grass drives? No. They're not? Um, the top one, I don't know that it's ever actually been used as an access. I think there are things actually blocking it, but the, it's the one closest to us that has always, from my experience, been used, and it is actually gravel. Okay. It's no longer a grass access drive. It's not. I believe it was May or June of 2017 that the gravel was installed. Okay. The grass parking areas? That is grass, yes. From okay, my... and that's right up against your, the side closest to your property, correct? Yes. Okay. Um, you see note three, total disturbed area, 4,998 square feet? I do. 
I'm going to ask you a, a question. Is it safe to assume, based on what you've seen, that the um, that the gravel paved grass access drive, or what's shown as a grass access drive, has uh, gravel pavement or surfacing greater than two square feet? Yes, and I have a photo of the okay. area if need be. Note B, the condition B, unless owner occupied, the manager must reside on the premises. Um, do you have any knowledge or indication whether uh, the owner, the LLC, or its representative, or their manager is residing on those premises? To my knowledge, um, based on documentation I have, no one lives on the property. The house and log cabin are both rented out in a whole, not in individual rooms. Okay. What else have you noticed uh, from the operations on the site that are different or contrary to what was testified to and in the decision in case 5822? Um, as far as like the activities? Yeah. Um, I would say the biggest thing has been the implementation of this, the DJ, that is just overwhelming and displaces us from our home on a regular basis because it can be held, heard inside our home. The bass is so intense that it vibrates our body outside and I can hear it in my bed pillow inside. And we, we can hear it over our television and that has been just horrific. I don't know any other way to put it. Do you remember music generally or particularly amplified music being discussed at all? No. During the hearing in 2015 in case 5822? No, not at all. Did the applicant mention it at all? No. The word music does not appear anywhere or in the transcript. And. Okay, so no testimony. It, it's not in the, the decision in case 5822, to the best of your knowledge, is it? No, because it was never discussed. Okay. Um, are the receptions being conducted inside? No, they're, in, they're under the tent. All right. What times of day are they operating? Um, they, well, they rent the property for 12 hours, so from about 11, I mean, they vary. I guess someone doesn't take up the whole 11 hours sometimes, but they go consistently until 10 o'clock. And then there's a lot of uh, activity of people leaving and yelling and sort of wrangling each other to leave the property. And then, so yes, from, I would say consistently from 4 to 10, for sure. But then outside of those areas also. There appears to be some, forgive me, everyone. There appears to be some landscaping. Leland Cypress is here. Do they exist? No, some of them do. They looked, it appeared as if they were sort of planted as an afterthought, but then never properly cared for to establish. And so most of them are dead or are dying. There also appears to be a stand of trees. Yes. Off the boundary line. Yes. In the Lippy Brothers property. Correct. Which the board referred to as trees in the vicinity of the pavilion, I believe. Um, are they are they still there? No. 
Um, not. No, not all of them, some of them, but they're very sparse now. Um, and some of them have fallen over. Um, there have been at least two times where one or more have come over, it seemed. Um, they were immediately, uh, within the, like, the first year or so, lifted, the, the, like the lower limbs lifted way up and so that decreased it. And then I could only assume that perhaps it wasn't healthy for the tree and they've since sort of started to die on their own. And now we've had high winds a couple of months ago and some of the, one, at least one of those trees, other trees have come out, but they're very thin. You can see right through them where they were a buffer before, but most definitely no longer. Okay, I'm showing you the exhibit. Um, the second page of the exhibit that was introduced as the plans that mm -hmm. were offered with the original application in case 5822. Um, near the top of the diagram shown, um, there's a line. This is 425 feet. Do you see that? Yes. Okay. Inside the line, with the rest of the site improvements shown, is a line of pine trees. Do you believe those, from your recollection, are these the pine trees that were being referred to at that, the hearing in okay. 2015? That's the only ones that could be, that they could be. There are no others that I... That were actually on the Lippies property? Yes, correct. With the board's indulgence. Okay. Talking about yes, there's these. Yeah, all pockets are the same. This also includes the um, outside of. So that's that's a that's one pack. Here's one pack, and here's one pack. So it's three, and they're highlighted. Like the, some of the, the important information has been highlighted. This is. I'm going to offer this as number seven. I think. Yes. And then this is, do you need this other copy or is this your copy? Okay. okay. This all was number seven? <coughs> yes. The, the uh, entire packet. I can call it 7A. I don't know whatever. 7B and 7C. B, C, D. Oh, they're, they're, they're different. A, B, C, D. Yes. Four, four Seven, A, B, C, D. Got it. <coughs> Seven, A. For the record, no objection to exhibit. 7A, B, C, and D. 7B. Okay. 
and we will accept those into evidence. Right. Thank you. Ms. Mrs. Hicks, mm -hmm. I'm going to call your attention to these two documents that are marked as evidence as 7A and 7B. Can you describe what they are? Uh, these are printouts of the Christian Royer House's current website as of yesterday. Um, they discuss the uh, offerings of weddings and then a separate tab pages within the website for events and rentals. The events and rentals where? At their facility. Okay. In, in the, I'll call it main house, as it's shown, in the application, in the plan submitted with the application, or in the log cabin? Um, this would be pertaining to the weddings and then uh, event parties. Okay, okay. A and B pertain to the events? Yes. Okay. What about C and D? C and D are pertaining to the rental of the main house and then the log cabin both each yes both. how many rooms in the main house five to my understanding five and it's the stated on here i'd offer those as number seven okay yeah we've we, we, we've entered those into evidence mrs um Hicks, is there anything else you'd like to tell the board? Um, nothing that I can think of. That's all the questions I have for Mrs. Hicks. Okay. Are there any questions of Ms. Hicks's testimony, and only of her testimony? There are. Okay. Um, Ms. Hicks, you, you testified that you had been present for and testified at the 2015. Uh, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, before you get started, for the record, uh, please state your name and address again before sure. you speak. Um, Andrew Kiphart, K-I-P-H-A-R-T, Bauhoff and Buckholtz LLC. We are located at 2333 Baltimore Boulevard. And could you pull your chair closer to the microphone sure. so that we can hear you? Thank you. Do you need me to repeat all of that? You need to put the microphone right in front of your face because it's, well, it's when you turn to one side, we can't hear you. Okay. Thank you. Andrew Kiphart, K-I-P-H-A-R-T, uh, of Bauhoff and Buchholz LLC. We are located at 2333 Baltimore Boulevard, Finksburg, Maryland. I represent um, Royer House, Christian Royer House, LLC. Uh, now, Ms. Hicks, you testified that you were present at the 2015 original approval and uh, testified there as well. Correct. Uh, and you stated that to the best of your recollection, uh, there would be no weddings or events until 10 p.m. Is that correct? Yes. Objection. Oh. I don't understand the question. That's not what she said. You just said until 10 p.m. Is that what you meant? So forgive me for, for paraphrasing. Uh, Based off the best of your recollection, how long would events be occurring at the Royer House? Um, of the 11 or 12 hours that they, they set up and all the activity of that, and then the receptions are typically four or five hours. Is it's, that what you're asking? It, so don't, oh, sorry. Don't ask questions. Okay. Do you understand his question? I guess I do not. No, no I do not. Could you rephrase your question? To the best of your recollection, as of the 2015 testimony, what were the, get the hours of operation for the Royer House? 12 to 5. Do you recall uh, a statement that there would also be receptions held after? Uh, there was the possibility, she said, if there was a reception or someone wanted to have one. So there was a possibility that that 5 o'clock could be extended? For a reception yes but not late into the evening
You had also testified that um, with regard to the, the screening, right, the, the trees along the access road, um, you had stated that <coughs> some of those trees had come down. Is that correct? Now? I didn't say that in 2015. Are you talking about today I said that? Correct. You testified today. Yes, that those trees have, yes, were cut and then have some have come down. Okay. And you said uh, with respect to the, the cypress trees that I can't remember your exact testimony, but that they didn't, they didn't look healthy. Is that, is that fair well, to say? Some are completely missing. Others are half dead and there's a few sort of hanger oners. Okay. Um, do you have any evidence today to show that trees are missing, downed, or? Um, well, let's see if it's, well, this photo, I could get it very easily from the, um, the uh, real estate listing would show it, and which is what this picture is from, from 20, I mean, that's, shows, I don't know what you, I mean, you can, I'm sure the board was there and saw it for themselves. Okay. Um, do you have any expertise and training in landscaping, arborism, or anything like that? No. So were you qualified to diagnose any sort of tree health or um, care for trees? It's brown, so that's no. It wasn't my question, ma'am. My question was, uh, are you qualified? No. Okay. Uh, you also testified earlier that um, with the, the DJ, the music can be heard inside of your home. Is that correct? Yes. Have you done anything? Have you um, filed any complaints? Have you contacted my clients? Well, what, what efforts have you taken in order to um, address what you are hearing? Uh, we sat down with the previous owners after our previous attorney sent them a cease and desist letter um, letting them know that we could hear the noise inside our home and they had nothing to offer as far as remediation. Um, we've also contacted the sheriff's department multiple times. We've had communications with the sheriff over the years. Uh, I've spoken to Jay Voigt about it. Um, I've taken out the decibel meter back when they were available and taken my own readings and many, many, many things. So to your knowledge, has anything come of any of those complaints? Have my clients ever been cited, fined? I don't know. Uh, you said that you had a, a decibel meter yourself. No, I borrowed the one when you were years ago, you were able to take one out from the, um, the sheriff's department. You could sign one out from the sheriff's department. And did you take readings with that decibel meter? Yes. And what did those readings show? Do you recall? They were over the limit. And what is the limit that you're referring to? I don't have it off the top of my head. I believe it's 65 during the daytime, but I don't have the, and that noise ordinance is apparently not enforceable. And you don't remember what the decibel reading showed? I would have to look it up. Are you talking about the cutoff for the noise ordinance or what it showed for me? I'm talking about what you measured. If I could pull my phone out, I could look and tell you that because I have video on my phone. Just to answer the question. I can't tell you. You also stated that you have knowledge and documentation that no manager or representative from the LLC was residing on the property. Is that correct? Correct. What is, what is the basis of that knowledge and documentation? I don't know what number. I believe it was seven at 7 C and D that shows the Airbnb listing and for the log cabin or actually we'll just go with the, the main house it states that during your stay we are a wedding and event venue during the months of May through October we will not be on the property or have events during your stay and will give wedding tours on designated days when the house is not being rented you will have the and in capital letters entire property to yourself except when there are guests staying in the log cabin on our property, but they have their own separate entrance and parking. Please respect their privacy. And the property offers five bedrooms for rent with 10 guests, okay. which so would be the maximum. Have you ever, are you aware of what individuals work for or manage my client's 
property? Am I aware of, well, I believe it's Ms. Leith, Mr. Ryan, and Ms. Sabina. And you can identify, that you would know them if you saw them in yes. person? Yes. Uh, and do you Well, two of the three, I believe that this is Mr. Ryan here, and I know that this is Mrs. Leith, and Ms. Sabina, is, I don't believe, is here. And do you see any of those individuals at the property on a regular basis? Uh, I've seen or heard, I guess, um, sometimes, not often. Um, you testified that the gravel driveway had a, a greater disturbance than, I believe the question was more than two, two square feet, is that right? Is that the question? You can ask the witness, not, not me. I'm not going to testify. So, forgive me if I paraphrase Mr. Bowersock's question. You testified that the gravel driveway, in your opinion, was disturbing more land than two square feet. Is that correct? I don't know that I specifically testified, but that is my, under that's my understanding of the have, situation. Have you ever measured the gravel driveway in any way? Well, there's um, a distance measurement on the site plan and it runs along not my question ma'am have you personally ever measured the gravel driveway no i've never stepped on have the property. you hired anyone to measure the gravel driveway i would not have access to do so okay uh, have you ever looked at a, a an aerial map or yes. anything like that the gis okay and i actually i guess i have actually measured it i don't have that calculation but i have used the gis tool too so you never actually calculated i did but i did not note it because it seemed pretty obvious so you have no evidence here today to, to corroborate your testimony that... Just the photo. And again, I would think the board had seen that themselves on their site visit. So during the, the testimony in 2015, did you get the sense that weddings and events would be held outside? Uh, that the weddings would be, but any receptions would be held inside. And where are you getting that conclusion? Um, they were asked specifically uh, how many people that the inside of the property would hold. And Mr. Bauhoff went on to describe the uh, uniqueness of the interior and that there would be 100 people could be held inside. Did my clients or Mr. Bauhoff state that receptions or parties would be held on the inside specifically uh, that was the understanding that was the so can you point at the actual testimony at the words that gave you that understanding or conclusion you want me to I, I want you to point to the actual do no, you I do not no I don't I know can you point to the actual testimony within the transcript I don't know Ms. Hicks, I'm going to show you a copy of the transcript. Okay. From the original 2015 hearing. Sure. So if you would, just do me a favor and, and flip through that and show the board um, what testimony, either from my client or Mr. Bauhoff, their attorney, um, you were relying on to make the conclusion that receptions would only be held inside the the main house I'm gonna object I don't think she mentioned she saw it in the transcript now if, if the board wants to indulge her while she reads through the transcript here in front of you that's fine but I heard her talk about what she recalled from the hearing if she's wrong mr. Kippart can offer some evidence of that. It's, it's hard for him to offer evidence if it's not in the transcript, Mr. Bowersox. I, that, that's I understand. The, so, and she testified that she felt as if the, the 2015 hearing, the receptions would be inside the house only, was her testimony, if my memory serves me correctly. That's correct, and if I could just add, it, her recollection or opinion is based off of the testimony as 
transcribed. So what I'm trying to get at is right, point me to the specific words used, testimony provided, that gave you that opinion or recollection. Show me where, where it is in the transcript. I think it's a fair question. And, and I, I think, it, Mr. Bowersox, your, your point that he could point it out, if it's not in the transcript, then it's not in the transcript. So uh, will Ms. Hicks, can you go ahead and answer, can you provide us? Uh, I have a, I would need time to look at the transcript and find the information. It was based on the. We'll, we'll go ahead and call about a 10 minute recess at this point. So, okay. so that you can do that. Okay. okay. Sure. Very good.
we'll call the hearing back to order. Be before we get started, Mr. Bowersox, there was um, a reference to a joint exhibit number one in the original case. Yes. That's not in the file. Is that what's on the screen right now? That is not. Um, Do you know? 5822? Yes. Do you know what the, that, that was the joint one. exhibit? It is. Hang, hang on to your hats and... Uh, what did you say? Hang on to your hands. Hang on to your oh, hands. hats. There seems to be some compatibility issues between you and the mouse. <laughs> yeah. I'm that, not, that wasn't a testimony. That was just an observation. I've never been a fan of rodents. Um, let me, I think it's near the back of this. So let me check. Forgive me. Wait. I have it. I think I have it tapped. Okay. It will be. Thanks for that. It is in what I'm showing as the record for case 5822. And if you'll bear with me, I'll try to pull that up for you. Yep, this is it. I'll show it to you when I. Join exhibit That's joint exhibit one. No, it's not. I'm trying. I'm trying to. The, 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 we don't have the pages tabulated in the scanned copy that I was provided, but I think it's right here. Joint one. Okay. Is that in this packet, uh, appellant exhibit yeah. three? Yeah. Oh, okay. Oh, I remember now. I went over that. Okay. Something about manure. It was about it was about manure. It was about the farming that would be going on around. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I recall that. The testimony. Okay. Yeah. That was. Uh, and that is in the past. It was a Lippy thing. Yeah. Right. Yeah, right. That was it, Mr. Lippy. Mr. Lippy and Clark it, Schaefer got were. Right. It says it's the 18th page in what I received as a scanned copy of your record in case 5822. I mean, okay. That's the best I can do to identify it. It was right at the beginning of the the before the the actual. It was a preliminary. Started. It was a preliminary. Uh, yes, sir. Discussion. Okay, very good. Thank you. Um, let's see. There it is. Miss Hicks, did you locate? Yes. Okay, very good. Am I? Yeah, could you yes, go? Yes. Go ahead and answer so, the question. So uh, there's not a lot of conversation or, or testimony about it, but on page 23. Um, one of the members asked about the functions inside the house. And that's where it said that they will be having um, up to 100 people. And that there were no plans for building anything um, outside of using the house. So it, would you agree that that's different than my client saying that receptions or weddings would only be held inside? Is it not? I don't believe so. Um, there was also a discussion of outside events. 
Was yes. there not? Weddings. There was a distinction made between weddings and receptions. And can you point to the record where you're getting that distinction, where that distinction was made? Uh, sure. There was talk of the weddings, and then um, did you want a page number? I do. Sure. So then they talk about if there was a reception, then that would be after. And I will just need to find the page. Uh, yes, on page 20 at the bottom. Just bear with me while I flip there. Okay, go ahead. Uh, you want me to read that? Yes, read the words that you're relying upon, please. Uh, that we would be doing day wed weddings, mostly as the events time came around. So it would probably... Most people are getting married and not are getting married until noon, maybe after four, maybe, I'm sorry. So if it would probably, most people aren't getting married until around noon, maybe afternoon and to four or five o'clock. And of course, if they just wanted to do reception there, there, then that would be after the wedding. So there's a distinction made between weddings and receptions. Wouldn't you agree that in that section that you just wrote, wrote or read, um, there is no mention of the word inside or outside? I don't think that's where it was discussed. It was in the other area when they went on to describe the unique features of the interior of the home being perfectly suited for the use. Um, and in that section, if you could point us to that, do they mention anywhere that only or receptions would only be held inside? I don't believe there's any specific discussion about that. It seems very specific. Can you point to the section that you're referring to? With regard to the page. architecture of the house? Right. Page number. Yes. Please. It is on page 24, midway down. And where on page 24 does the speaker say that receptions would be held only inside? Oh, I thought you were asking me about the architecture of the house and how it's perfectly suited for the use. Let me ask the question a different way. Yes, Can you point to any page in the transcript where my clients or their representatives say that receptions would only be held inside? Not at this time. What do you mean by not this time? Not at this time. Because I have not had ample opportunity. I, I don't know what you're trying to ask me and I feel like... Do you not understand the question? I understand the question. I think I'm she sure you understand my answer. I think she answered. <clears throat> uh, no further questions for this witness. Okay. I have some redirect. Go ahead, Mr. Barstocks. This is the only one I have. <coughs> Ms. Hicks, I'm going to show you something that's being marked as number eight. Mm -hmm. Can you identify that? Yes, this is an aerial of 817 Friedinger Mill Road, the Christian okay. Warrior House property. Now I'm going to ask you quickly, mm -hmm. the trees along the lower part of that image. Yes. Are those the pine trees that we talked about before that were shown inside the 425 foot line? Yes. Okay, that the site plan showed as being on the lippy plane. Correct. And there looks to be a gravel or chip driveway between the trees and the other improvements on the property. Correct in the vicinity of where the uh, grass access strip was shown on the site plan. Correct. Is that what you were talking about in your testimony before? As far as the gravel drive versus a grass drive? Yes. Yes. And the pine trees that you're seeing there, are they still there? Some of them. Some of them. Yes, I think some of these middle ones here, and then they're very thin. Okay, but that doesn't show 
for Leland Cypress? No. Okay. Um, I, I would object only to foundation. I, I don't know when the picture was taken, who took it, whether it's a fair and accurate depiction, et cetera. The source of Redfin is the listing from when the property was sold in 2019, August of 2019. This is from the real estate listing from Redfin that shows multiple pictures that are still available for viewing, and this is just one of them. Did someone give this to you? No, I printed it myself. Okay. Did you manipulate the photo no. in any way? No, I would not know how to do such a thing. Okay. Nor would I. So, so the testimony is that this photograph is prior to 2019. No, it is in 2019. 2019. Now, I took. I printed this yesterday. But, yeah, but but the, the photo the, was the taken. The photo is from 2019, 2019 when the property before. was listed for sale. Okay. I, I would ask how the witness knows that that photo was taken in 2019. You didn't take that photo, correct? No. Do you know who took that photo? I would imagine the company that listed the property, the, the photographer. You said company. you would imagine. So is it fair to say that you don't know who took that photo? Someone above that works with the realtor. The source of it was from Redfin. the published Yes, an MLS listing. listing, an MLS listing. All right. So you are attesting that this is what you saw on their website as a photo of this property. Yes. from their listing yes you haven't altered it in no any way. absolutely not okay I will withdraw the objection but I mean the record is clear that she doesn't know who took the photo she did not take the photo and she can't tell us when that photo was taken and and, and that will be duly noted with with the exception with uh, with us accepting that into evidence thank you I'm going to ask Mr. Dixon. Um, I have a copy of what purports to be the record in case 516, excuse me, 6158, the proceedings here today. From July 22nd, 2019. It's a letter from Jim DeWeese, Sheriff James DeWeese, dated July 22nd, 2019. Is that in the record of this case? Uh, I don't recall that. I'll have to, I'd have to look at the file. Is it, is it in this, uh, what you have as an appellant's no, exhibit? No, that's from 5822. Okay, 5822. From, the case, from this case today that we're hearing, 6158. I don't think I see it, Mr. Barasak. You want to just introduce it in evidence? Well, I have it as part of the entire record of case number 6158 that was introduced, it was forwarded to Mr. Menashe as part of the record to go to the circuit court. 
It shows as page 31. Unfortunately, it's not in six, or excuse me, 5822 where I'd pull it up. Well, do you have a copy of it? Just this one. Let me show it to council real quick. Objection to that letter. No. Uh, as number nine. Okay. I'll leave that with you for now. If you want, I'll make a quick copy right now. Oh, thank you. you. They went for uh, co uh, the other council. Nine. Okay. Nine. Nine. Yes, nine. And without objection, we'll go ahead and enter this into evidence. Thank you. Exhibit number nine. May I resume? Yes. You testified, Ms. Hicks, that um, you made several attempts to address the, per the noise that you were um, perceiving in your home from the site. Is that correct? Yes. 
And some of those complaints went to the sheriff's office? Correct. I've just introduced a letter from Mr. DeWeese, which was apparently in the record of this case from 2019. Um, to the effect, and what what is your recollection of what Mr. DeWeese's response was to your requests? Uh, that there was no enforceable noise ordinance. I have an email here from communication with him, if I could refer to that. Or is it just out of my recollection? Uh, well, first your recollection. Um, just that you? there was, they did not, they no longer for some reason had the equipment uh, pro then could offer it and you were even use it themselves and that their officers were not certified and they did not have the funds to get that back in place, that they had actually requested funds from the commissioners but were denied and that he had not been aware of it initially and was working to get it resolved. All right. And you were asked a question under cross-examination about whether you were aware that um, Mr. Kippart's clients had ever been fined or cited based on your complaints. Do you remember that? Yes, I do. do you, um, is it your understanding that this is why they may not have been? Yes. At least in part? I was told by one of the officers that came out to our home one night that there was no citation, even if they were found to be. Um, in violation that there was not something to even cite them with. Okay. Words indulgence. You had testified to this passage in your cross-examination. Yes. Um, about the distinction being drawn between receptions and weddings. Is this what you're understanding? This is this at least part of what you're understanding of the difference between outdoor weddings and the conduct of receptions inside yes. is based on? Yes, as well as, yes. Okay. I have no further questions. Um, I have brief recross. Uh, Ms. Hicks, do you still have the, the transcript in front of you? I do. Could you turn to page 24? Yes. All right, so page 24, Member Kramer, in that second paragraph, I'm just going to read those, those final three sentences. You have a walking trail in the back. You have an arbor. Do you have functions or do you plan functions outside under that arbor and so forth? Jennifer Snyder's response, yes. Do you recall that exchange? I'm not sure what, no, I'm not, I mean, I've read the, the transcript, but I don't recall it from that day. Okay. I don't now, know what the arbor is. You can read the transcript in front of you now today, can yes, you not? Yes, I am. And based off of that question and answer, is it still your opinion that my clients in some way uh, said that events, any events, would only be held inside? There would be weddings and receptions indoors. Weddings outside and receptions indoors. I don't know any other way to say it. I'm sorry. No further questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, board members, no, wait. Any members of the audience have any questions of Ms. Hicks' testimony? Only her testimony. Okay. Board members, question of Ms. Hicks' testimony. I have one, if I may. Mr. Snyder. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Hicks, thanks for being here. And the question would be that I see the letter from the Sheriff's Department is dated July. 2019, nearly three years ago. Um, not quite, but nearly three years ago. I would assume you've had interactions with them since? Yes. And has this dynamic changed relative to uh, their ability to be able to monitor noise no. or anything? No, there's no. Um, how often would you say you've called the police since, or Sheriff's Department, I'm assuming that's the state police, but the Sheriff's Department sure. in the last three years? 
Um, well, we try not to call because we don't want to be a burden, but I would say approximately eight times. Okay. Understood. Typically leave our home. And what was their response when they got there? Obviously you interacted it's with them. It's been different. Um, uh, there was one particular that uh, officer, I don't know what their titles are, but um, that came out, uh, I believe it was Officer Bud. Um, he basically stood on my back patio and said that he couldn't believe that such a, uh, activities would be happening in this area. He was dumbfounded. Um, there was another, I was actually on the phone with one of the officers um, having a conversation letting him know what was going on and he could actually hear the events through the phone on the other end of the phone as I stood out on my back porch. And that's been basically all of them just sort of Understood. Any hands. other further, any other uh, interactions directly with Sheriff DeWeese relative to the situation since 19? I've never actually had um, interactions other than the emails that I received through my attorney and conversations relayed in the letters. Understood. And you don't have any knowledge of the Sheriff's Department's interactions uh, with the facility, the facility manager, or whatever, relative to your complaints? No. No final. No. Thank you. M Ms. Hicks, just to get in my own mind, sure. the, the home that you live in, is that the house that Paul Herring built? Yes, it is. Okay, that's. I just wanted to make sure yes. that. Yes. I, di I didn't see any tax maps so that I could see, but yes, I just wanted to make sure. Yes, okay. he bought it after he passed from Barbara. Okay. Uh, Ms. Hicks, if I may ask a question or two. Uh, did you ever consider using a private firm that's certified and uh, measuring sign levels? I'm sorry, I say again, I, did, I didn't mean to cut you off. Did you ever consider using a private firm that's certified in measuring sound levels? Yes. Um, it's been unbelievably difficult to find anyone, um, and we weren't sure what the cost associated with, and we've asked and asked and asked what would be even of the county, who would be appropriate, that would be appropriate for this board or another, and we ever can't, there's a lot of times we can't get answers or we get the runaround, and I don't know who to call. I've Googled, and I'm very good at searching things on the internet, and I can't, I don't know who would be appropriate and who would be acceptable as an expert witness, I would imagine, would be necessary. Okay, understood. Um, I have looked into it. Last question. Uh, do you recall your testimony in uh, 2015? Um, there was an exchange between the attorney representing the Snyders and you, and, you, and looking at the video, you seem to be satisfied with uh, his response. Did you uh, remember that? I do remember that. Could you tell me what it was? Uh, Can I interrupt? Sure. Response to what? Yeah, I was talking about specifically what. See, uh, at the end of uh, uh, Ms. Hicks's testimony, there's a comment made by the attorney for the Snyders. It is off mic. Oh, I'm but not it, familiar with that. It was off mic? Well, he had turned around to talk to you, but you seem to be satisfied with what he said. I was curious as to what that might be. I, I don't recall that. You don't recall it? No. Fair enough. It's, it's not in the transcript. So. Is it saying inaudible or something? It's inaudible, yes. The comment was inaudible. If I could look, it might refresh my memory, but I don't, I'm not, I'm not sure. I can't speak to that. Right. It just you know, it appeared to me, looking at the video transcript, that you were satisfied with his response, but you don't remember what it was. No, I do not off the top of my head. I know that at that time I'd asked questions and then thought I would get another opportunity, but that was never given to actually provide my own testimony, and that was never available. Okay, available. fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Simmons? Okay. Mr. Bowersox, next witness? I have no other witnesses. Okay. So with that, um, Mr. Kephart, uh, you want to go ahead and give your opening comments and then go ahead and call witnesses um i, I would uh, could i ask mr bauer Sox to switch seats or move seats i'd like oh, to be sure. able to direct sure. the basically go through the the we'll, we'll allow you to play musical the chairs. transcript as, as he did in his opening So Mr. Bowersox and I actually do agree in terms of the, the legal standard here, um, and that is the, the substantial change standard, right? No substantial change shall be made in the plans presented to the BZA without the approval of the BZA. 
Um, and it, it is their burden today to prove what substantial changes, if any, um, have occurred between the testimony and evidence presented in the 2015 hearing and the site plan that was approved in 2019. So what I'm going to do today is just go through the transcript. I have flagged, uh, and I'll try to be as brief as possible, um, all of the instances in which my clients testified as to their specific plans with respect to the operation of the business, especially those plans with respect to all of the issues that um, the Hicks have identified in their presentation presentation earlier today. I, I've sort of couched them in a few different camps. They appear to be hours of operation, occupancy, um, number of events, inside versus outside events, um, screening, and um, music and or noise. So with that, I will proceed with the transcript. So there's actually two things that Mr. Bowersox and I agree on today, and that is this mouse is unwieldy at best. Oh dear. Are you all still able to read that on your screen? Could you click it positive just one more time, please? Yeah. Thank you. Right. All right, so the first instance I have is in the middle of page 10. And this is Mr. Bauhoff speaking, who's present today and in the audience. Uh, and he mentions that the nearest residential property owner is property line to property line is 600 feet away. Fortunately, there's either between that property and the main house that is proposed. Could you speak? Could you speak up a little bit? Get a little closer to the microphone. I can. Yeah. Up? Sorry. All right. So I'm just reading directly from that uh, that first paragraph. The nearest residential property owner is the property line to property line 600 feet away. Um, next sentence, between that property and the main house that is proposed to be the inn, there's a mature 40-foot line of pine trees. That is with respect to the, uh, the screening of that gravel access drive that we're talking about. And when I call my witnesses, you'll hear about some of the other, um, sort of the, the development of that um, screening. All right, page 14. So here at the bottom of page 14, we have um, a question from Mr. Bauhoff to Miss Snyder. Uh, first of all, when do you see, foresee these weddings occurring? Uh, we're anticipating next season, possibly a wedding a weekend would be optimistic but that would be the plan for the next. Um, so that's uh, the first indication of how many events per season my clients initially expected, right? And, and she's couched that um, with uh, what I'm gonna call qualifying language, right? And that's language that uh, is like possibly, right? We, we plan, that means that this is somebody that is Right, just getting started in a business. They don't know exactly what the property will be able to handle. They don't know exactly what the demand is going to be, but they're trying to make their best efforts in terms of providing the board um, a reasonable basis for um, approval. Um, next page. Uh, question from Mr. Bauhoff. So that will allow you to do outside weddings. The answer, correct. And then the following question, when is it based upon uh, what Mr. Lippy said, uh, when is your wedding season anticipated? And again, the, even the question here is, is qualifying, right? Well, when do you anticipate your uh, wedding season to be? May to October, early October is the answer there. Moving forward, and if any point you need me to slow down or speed up, please shout out. I'll try not to be duplicitous with 
what we're doing, but a lot of this hinges on what's actually in the transcript. All right, so here, member Tiegler asks, uh, Ms. Snyder, what will your hours of operation, hours or days of operation be? Snyder responds, initially we haven't really discussed that, but we would be doing day weddings mostly as the event's time came around. It would probably, most people aren't getting married until around noon, maybe afternoon into the four or five o'clock. And of course, if they wanted to do the reception there, then that would be after the wedding. Now we've heard much to do about um, the 10 p.m., right? Uh, figure that is put on the 2019 site plan. Uh, so if you've got a wedding starting at four or five o'clock and you're also budgeting time for a reception to happen after a wedding that begins at four or five o'clock, um, ultimately the, the testimony will show today that's, that's what they're budgeting for, right? They're, they're budgeting for a wedding beginning four or five o'clock and within those hours of operation, if you always w also want a reception, then that, that will put you at around 10 p.m. What page is that? That was page 20 of the transcript. Testimony provided by Ms. Snyder. Page 21, uh, you're aware there would be some noise ordinances and that you can't violate them. Jennifer Snyder, yes. Can't violate them. Yes, I'm aware of those. So the question was asked twice about noise violations and noise. She's aware of them and the need not to violate them. Page 22, this is with respect to parking. Uh, we would definitely have some someone controlling or regulating uh, parking and traffic control. This is this is a big feature uh, amongst uh, Member Tegler's questioning. If you guys have reviewed the testimony, uh, Member Tegler asked quite a few questions regarding uh, par parking and, and how that was going to be regulated and controlled. Uh, page 23, how many rooms within the big house will you have available for people to rent over the weekends or whatever the function may be. Five, uh, that's correct. How many people are you able to serve in your country in and will any one particular function? Uh, Jennifer Snyder responds, on the inside. Member Kramer, yes. Jennifer Snyder, up to 100. So in Mr. Bowersox's earlier uh, presentation, right, he had um, alluded to this 100 number as the only number with respect to occupancy. However, that number is it was a, a specific answer to a specific question, right? The, the member asked how many people will be on the inside of the, the, the country in, right? Jennifer Snyder even clarifies that in the inside. Member Kramer, yes, up to 100. Um, and when I call Ms. Snyder, she'll, she'll provide the, the context for that argument as well. Moving into page 25, we have uh, a discussion amongst um, the members and Ms. Snyder with respect to um, Johnny on the spots, porta potties, and um, outdoor bathroom facilities. Um, this didn't really feature much in uh, Mr. Bowersox's presentation today, so I'll just highlight that for you. Um, 26. Um, we have uh, the sort of the framework for the adjustment of um, ordinary operating hours based off of right the, the business experience once they begin um, operating on the property. So member Kramer asks, so your hours actually of, of operation could change because if you're going to have a wedding at 12 noon, your caterer will probably be in there setting up something around nine o'clock in the morning. Jennifer Snyder. Yes, that's true, right? So we've got sort of an, an, an adjustment period here happening both at the beginning and indeed at the end in Jennifer Snyder's earlier testimony when member, uh, I can't recall which member it was, but the, the member asked um, about, right, weddings and the receptions occurring after, right? So weddings, four to five o'clock was when they were beginning and then receptions would inevitably occur after that. So you've got a you've got a, a clear presentation here of the anticipation of greater hours of operation in order to accommodate the business plan that is developing through the the testimony and the site plans to be submitted. Uh, 
Page 27, Member Kramer. Of course, how many people do you have outside things that are taking place under the canopy or the arbor as far as table, chairs, and so forth? So again, here we have um, discussion of events happening outside, right? Ms. Hicks' testimony was that there was, a, there was this clear distinction between weddings and receptions, and weddings would only be held outside, or weddings would be held outside and receptions, other events would only be held inside. Um, despite the fact that she cannot point to any instance within the transcript in which my clients or their representatives say that receptions would only be held inside. In fact, uh, just the opposite. There's, right, there's uh, discussion of workers and, and set up uh, to be used as many as needed in order to accommodate the, the outdoor functions. And forgive me, that discussion on outdoor functions, I actually skipped over, that was on page 24. And this I highlighted in my cross-examination of, of Ms. Hicks earlier, right? Member Kramer asks, you have a walking trail in the back, you have an arbor, do you have functions or do you plan functions outside under that arbor and so forth? General Snyder's response, yes. There's a, a clear indication for the, the, the plan to conduct events weddings, receptions, right? This is functions. Functions could be, right, any event. This is ultimately a, not just a, a country inn and a wedding venue, but they, they host other functions there as well. All right, skipping far ahead to page 37. Um, this is actually um, Steve Hicks, who is um, uh, the husband, your clients are married, correct? Husband of, of Ms. Hicks. Um, during the opportunity for comments from the audience, Steve Hicks stands up and he testifies here. Um, and what he says is he actually foresees some of that sort of later operation, those operating hours, he foresees this uh, potential and he asks the question because he's there. Sometimes there might be like a late afternoon or evening wedding and then if there's a reception it goes what? Until 9, 10 o'clock at night and then the caterer is probably there what a few more hours. Uh, and the response is we found that after they start cleaning up before the caterers are usually gone before this. So th there's, there's clearly an, a, a foreseeable, right, expansion of the hours of operation in order to accommodate those later in the afternoon or evening weddings and events and right the, the run time of those is going to extend into the evening time that's actually foreseen by steve hicks the, the petitioner today and it's responded to by our clients at the the time of the 2015 hearing All right. page 38 uh, it's not necessarily your aspiration to do like three weddings a weekend for the entire season or something like that. This is a question again from Steve Hicks. He's foreseeing the opportunities um, for uh, you know, a greater volume of events across the weekend. Uh, Jennifer Snyder responds, initially, I don't think that's possible. Steve Hicks, that's something that you'd like to happen, Jennifer Snyder, I don't know. I hear things Friday, Saturday, and then she's interrupted by Steve Hicks again. Uh, And I would also just highlight uh, Steve Hicks' initial testimony after hearing all of the, the earlier testimony that I've, I've gone over here. And that is page 35, excuse me. Steve Hicks, sure, hi, I'm Steve Hicks, spells his name. So everything sounds pretty good. I'm concerned about these trailers. And, and I believe Miss Hicks even said something similar, that, that they felt that at least on the day that uh, my clients had been forthright in responding to their concerns. Uh, Mr. Bauhoff even, I believe, fielded some questions as well. Um, so in the presentation today, they've they've highlighted a number of um, a number of issues, right? And, and I've sort of characterized them on my own, but I'm sure Mr. Bauer Sox will, in his closing, highlight the ones that he feels are, are most appropriate. But they tend to be 
um, in, in some similar veins. Those are hours of operation, occupancy, noise, um, parking, screening, and indoor versus outdoor. So what I'd like to do now is call some of the witnesses that I have brought here today. I have Jen Snyder and Mark Snyder. They were um, the original um, applicants that were approved for the conditional use. They also submitted the amended site plan as it was approved in 2019, and I will have them testify as to you know that their how they operated the business within the confines of the testimony in 2015 and the amended site plan. Um, and then I will call um, the, the current owners um, who are operating within that amended site plan as well. So I'll begin with uh, Ms. Jen Snyder. Before we do, may I request a short recess? Yes. Thank you. Five minutes, 10 minutes? Five minutes. Okay, we'll go ahead and uh, we'll have a five minute recess.
So you, you may call your first witness. I'm going to call Jennifer Snyder. Jennifer, if you could state your name, your address, and your occupation for the board. Uh, Jennifer Snyder, S-N-Y-D-E-R, 36103 Bonefish Court, Lewis, Delaware, uh, 19958, and I'm retired. <laughs> now, Ms. Snyder, you were the original applicant in case um, 5822, isn't that correct? That's correct. And you were also a member of the Royer House LLC. Correct. And you testified at the 2015 hearing to, to great length. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Um, and you also contracted to have the simplified site plan, which is on the screen in front of you. Is you had you contracted to have that made up? Is that correct? Correct. Uh, so, Ms. Snyder, I'm going to direct you, if I can get this to cooperate. Uh, so here at the top corner, we see the, the season and the oper hours of operation. Do you see that? Yes. And that says event times, April 26th to October 21st, 4 p.m. to 10 p.m. Is that correct? Correct. And what is your recollection of your testimony in the two, before the 2015 approval um, with respect to the season and hours of operation? Uh, I believe we said that, well, according to the testimony, um, May through October was the prime wedding season. And with respect to hours of operation, what is your recollection of your testimony as to what your hours of operation would be? So that weddings generally start somewhere between noon and five, and then there's a reception afterwards, if that's what they choose. Now, you heard my earlier presentation when I, I read through parts of the transcript, is that correct? Yes. Uh, so do you also recall, either in my presentation or your own recollection of the testimony before 2015, um, what I phrase as an adjustment period? That is a period which would allow you to um, provide setup or take down of whatever events were occurring on the property. Correct. And you testified to that effect at the 2015 hearing, isn't that correct? Yes. So I'm going to just highlight this grass parking area that was identified in, in Mr. Bowersock's presentation. Are you familiar with this grass parking area? Yes. And can you give the board just a sense of how, why that was necessary? Um, our original intention was to park on the other side of the driveway, which was Mr. Lippy's property, and we had gotten permission from him to use it. And then when it was submitted, uh, the Deb Bowers said it was ag preservation and we could not use that as parking, that it had to be on site. So we moved all the parking behind the log cabin. And do you recall any testimony before the, the in the 2015 case, do you recall any testimony to the, um, to the effect that um, there would be a, a grass parking area utilized? Yes, yes. Um, it was discussed, several options were discussed in the whole planning process, and that was one of them as well, and I believe that is what was testified to by um, Bradley Bayhill, saying that there was a grassy area with ample parking. <coughs> and it, just at this point, is my level okay? Bring it, okay. I'm also just going to highlight this um, tent, this proposed tent area. Mm -hmm. Do you recall any testimony w regarding a, a proposed tent for uh, functions outside? Um, I do recall not specifically saying a tent, but that, um, and I believe it became inaudible. Um, we, we discussed 
Mr. Ba Bayhoff said we didn't have the budget for to build an outside building, but our intention was always that we would have a facility for the reception area um, and that we wouldn't be building one. Can you describe the tent that you use on the property? Um, it is 40 by, 40 by 80. Forgive me. If is 50 by 80. Sorry. Mark, I'll, I'll ask Mark the questions about the tent <laughs> yeah. if that's going to be the better. I just couldn't remember the size. Sure. It's just it's a vinyl tent that's erected uh, yearly or when the permit is you know allows um, mm -hmm. with all four sides two exit areas um, it's a vinyl tent all right you would you would also testified that um, a manager would be residing on the property isn't that correct that's correct and who did you employ or have residing on the property when you owned uh, the Royer house so we bought the property in June of 2015 and my daughter Alexandra and her husband Zach Campbell actually moved in in May of 2015 into the cabin okay. and they lived there throughout the time we owned it and in fact you you testified to that effect that your daughter Alexandra and her husband would be moving into the cabin and they would be the on-site manager per the zoning regulations for a country Inn. isn't that correct yes that's correct okay. All right. let's talk about the screening of this um, gravel drive um, in the in the picture here we've got a, a number of trees is that correct yes that's correct and they were existing those were existing trees uh, when you purchased the property correct okay and then there's a notation here for the cypress yes w were those, those existing no those were put in for screening um, so can you say a bit more about that why why those trees were put in uh, it was a request um, that we plant trees to screen the parking from the county who made that request um, was it clay? Oh, yes it was clay black okay and clay black asked you to to plant more screening for the parking area and you planted those trees and reflected them on your amended site plan is correct. that correct yes that's correct okay. how about this gravel driveway that gives access to the grass parking area I remember um, during mr. Bowersock's presentation there was um, some, some discussion as that was not a grass drive that was a gravel drive can you clear up that distinction so it was an existing access drive there was a, a like a fire pit back there um, so there was an existing it had um, some kind of material down but it wasn't like large gravel it was just flush to the ground so it was already existing when we bought the property so it was there was never a grass drive on the property when you owned it is that correct a grass drive no it was always gravel correct oh yes just to the to the pavilion right. and, and so when you were hosting events at the Royer house um, how how was parking handled so we had uh, two people always uh, monitoring parking and a third person usually at the top of the driveway um, just to kind of control and then someone right at the access where the uh, right past the handicap parking to direct people where to go and then s someone actually directing where to park in the parking spots within that parking area Um, as part of approval for a country in you also have to have um, rooms available for rent isn't that correct that's correct and did you have rooms available for rent when you were operating the Royer house yes five in the house Just the board's indulgence for one moment
Did the Hicks ever contact you um, to discuss any of the complaints that they had regarding your operation of the business? Uh, not directly. Uh, we received a letter from their attorney um, and I believe it was in 2017, the fall of 2017, I was called out of the state for six months. Um, sorry. To take care of our youngest daughter, um, who had a small child at the time and who was very sick. So I was living in California. We met with the Hicks and their attorney when, we ret when I returned back to Maryland in, I believe it was March, April timeframe. And what was the basis of their um, issues with the way that you were operating the property at that time? Um, it was uh, mostly, if I recall, yes, it was noise, um, and we discussed options and how we could handle the noise, and we hired, um, and I'll let Mark talk about that because he was my noise man, but we did consult with somebody. They spent an entire day out there, um, and they were concerned about um, traffic on Beggs Road. Okay. And what was their concern about traffic on Beggs Road? Um, that that uh, wedding, people coming to the wedding were using Beggs Road to access the actual venue itself. Okay, and just to be clear, Beggs Road is a, a public road? Yes, it is. And <coughs> Did you, in your operation of the business, did you all do anything um, to direct or redirect um, patrons of your business, um, give them directions on how to get to the property, how to park at the property, et cetera? Can you explain that for the board? Um, when we first purchased the property, there was, with Google Maps, a problem with the directions. Oh, go ahead. Sit back a little bit from the oh, mic. Am I way too loud? <laughs> no, you're, you're causing popping. You're oh, okay. Okay, sorry. Um, can you hear me okay? I'm not getting feedback, so that's why no, I thought. That's fine. You're good. Um, so in, um, in the beginning, we, it, there was a problem with Google Maps with their directions, and so it was taking people on Beggs Road. So we actually told our brides and parties, please send out directions so that they, you know, they're getting to the, the proper place. I worked with Google, Google Maps for about two years and I finally got it resolved. And we really didn't see, I didn't see a problem after that. We didn't really see a problem after that. We had maybe two or three cars that came down the farm access road um, accidentally, but uh, we did block off that bottom area so that they realized they and we tried to catch people if somebody did come down and let them know that the main road was around the corner on Friedinger Mill Road. Okay so other than the noise which Mark will testify to as, as your noise man as you put it um, and the parking and, and Beggs Road access did the, the Hicks identify any other issues with your operation of the business at that time? Um, I don't believe so. I don't recall. Were you ever contacted um, by the police, the county, or any other governmental authority with respect to any complaints regarding your operation of the business? Um, the county, twice in the very beginning before we even started having events. And what were those contacts? Can you give the, the board a sense of what? Um, you mean who contacted me? Correct. Um, so um, Mr. Black contacted me initially saying they had gotten complaints that we were taking down trees on our property. Were you taking down trees on your property? Yes, they were dead. And did you replace those trees? Um, not the one that they're that we took down a big one that was over in front of the house okay. um, so it, over in front of the house can you just direct me so I'll try to use the mouse here the house, oh, the house is up further yeah. yeah see that big house right next to the I mean the That's yes the this okay. is the house okay right down is a tree right there that one this guy mm -hmm. okay 
yeah. So we had trees taken down. We had a professional arborist come in. He evaluated all the trees along the driveway, all the trees along the property line, the existing that we had discussed earlier, basically all the trees on the property. Um, we took the big one down in front of the house and he recommended limbing up the ones all along the driveway, which are uh, red, ma red maples, and then limbing up the ones that were existing along the property line, um, which were discussed earlier, because that would ensure they would stay healthy. Okay. And you followed all the directions of the arborist that you hired, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. And just to be clear, that big tree in front of the house that you took down, that tree was not a part of the screening effort for the gravel drive and the parking situation at the Royer House, is that correct? No, that's, yes, that's correct. <laughs> um, so other than um, Mr. Mr. Black reaching out to you about the tree, do, were you ever contacted by the police about noise or any other complaint with respect to the operation of the business? Um, the only other person that contacted <coughs> us um, was um, I can't think of her name. Oh, um, I spoke with Deb Bowers, who is Ag Preservation. I guess she's still there. I'm not sure. She had um, contacted me regarding a letter that was sent to the Lippies indicating we were using their property to park cars for events and we were using their shed i believe it was stated in the letter um, to store um, equipment for our business and i wrote a letter response to to mr lippy to, with hit from his letter and called Deb Bowers and told her we had not had any events yet. It was June of 2015. We didn't have any events until the fall of 2016. Um, and that also, or I'm sorry, uh, the summer of 2016, and that we, the shed was not part of the discussion uh, and that we stored our Kubota tractor in the barn and she said that that was allowed because it was used for ag agricultural okay. purposes. So have you ever been contacted by the police or anyone else with respect to noise at all during your operation of the business? No. Uh, during your testimony during 2015 you were under oath, isn't that correct? That is correct. And did you present testimony that was your best effort and anticipation for how you would operate the business at that time? Yes. And did you submit a site plan that was consistent with your testimony in 2015? Yes. Uh, no further questions for the wis this witness. Mr. Bowersox, any yeah. questions of her testimony? I, I do. I do. Um, good. Uh, morning still Ms. Snyder mm -hmm. good morning um, you were asked some questions <clears throat> you were asked about the grass parking area shown on the site plan okay do you, do you recall you mean during the 2015? No, no, no. Oh. During Mr. Kippart's oh, yes. examination. Mm -hmm. um, and you said there was parking discussed with the county, that there was plenty of grassy area. Was that discussed with the Board of Zoning Appeals, or was that discussed with Mr. Black and Development Review as part of the site plan? No, that is in the testimony of 2015. Was it discussed that you would be putting that parking in that location? In the location shown as I, grass parking area? I don't, I don't believe that was discussed. Up, I don't know. Okay, it was generic. Yeah, we've got plenty of room. I mean, I believe uh, Bradley Bayhoff's 
statement in here was there was grassy parking behind the cabin and around that area. Mr. Bauhoff was your counsel at the time. Correct. He was not your witness. Correct. Okay. Um, you talked about limbing up some trees. Uh, Clay Black, I believe it was, or someone from the county had contacted you. Um, you also talked about, he said, and there were complaints about trees coming down on the property, is what you just testified to. Correct. You hired an arborist. Correct. And they made certain recommendations. Yes. And you talked about felling the uh, tree, I'm just going to say near the main house. And you've explained that. But you also said in limbing up trees. Which trees did you limb up? So there's a, um, going up the driveway, there's up the tree. Up towards your Mill Road. Correct, okay. the tree line driveway. Limbed those up, because they, of course, hung down too far. For, right. Um, and also the trees that were in discussion prior, or that you had discussed earlier along the- trees on the Lippy property? Correct. The Beggs Road access um, issue that uh, you say you struggled with Google Maps for, they weren't accessing the pro they were accessing the property from Beggs Road, but they had to come through one of the Lippy's fields. Is that correct? No. That's... Farm access road through the field. I'm sorry. Can they had to come across a farm access road from Beggs Road? I guess I, the farm, yes, the farm access road, correct. Yeah, because you said you blocked it. J at, not at the top, no, because that, we can't block that. I understand. Down on our driveway. Okay. That way we felt that if people saw that, it would prevent them from coming down. Understood. You mentioned that you you mentioned that your uh, daughter and son-in-law, I believe, moved into the log cabin in May 2015. That is correct. Okay. How? When did you sell the property? Um, August of 2019. Okay, four years after you started. Um, right, not too long after the date of the approved simplified site plan, correct? It's, it's, a, it's not a trick question. April 26, I didn't, I was just looking for, yes, that's correct. <laughs> um, prior to that time, you had a few different iterations of the simplified site plan, did you not? Okay. Do you recall the notes in the site plan saying there would be no rooms for rent? On yes. The simplified site plan. Yes, the the original site plan did say that, and and they admitted to the mistake and took it out. Okay. So when, when did the grass driveway become a gravel driveway? In other words, you say it was in a particular state when you bought it, but that subsequently there was gravel placed on it, if I heard you correctly. Yeah, it was a, a, a dirt access to the, 
dirt and gravel back to the um, fire pit area, which was near the log cabin. Um, I don't know if you can see the log cabin. Linda yes. parked to the log cabin. When did it stop being dirt and gravel and become a gravel driveway? It still is a dirt and gravel. As far as I know. There has been, um, I'll withdraw that. Do you remember when you were specifically asked, and, and trust me, I, I get that this was seven years ago, um, um, by Mr. Tegler, what will your hours of operation, hours or days of operations be? Do you remember what you replied? Just what I've read from the, okay. from the transcript. If I told you it says we would be doing day weddings, mostly as the events time come around. So it would probably be most people aren't getting married until around noon, maybe afternoon into the four or five o'clock. And of course, if they just wanted to do a reception there, then that would be after the wedding. Do you remember giving that testimony? Yes. Mr. Kipphart's made the suggestion on your behalf that when you were making the testimony such as that, you were doing the best you could to anticipate what your operation would look like. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. But you had never operated something like this before, is that correct? That's correct. All right. It's a best guess, um, innocently, nothing wrong with that. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. There's also some suggestion that he made, and you, you finished up the testimony, and I'm talking about page 20 to 21. We wouldn't plan on being late into the evening. Um, you said four to five, but you didn't say that the receptions would continue up until a certain hour after that. Is there a reason you didn't do that? Not that I recall. I mean, there was no time asked, so. They didn't ask and, and you didn't advise. So they wouldn't have known that you're looking at your plans to go to 10 o'clock, 9 o'clock. Well, I think it's rather clear in here that there would be where is it clear in here there would be events after the wedding and they would go into the evening and wouldn't plan on being late into the evening and i guess it's whose perspective of what late is but you you made it clear you're looking at noon to four or five o'clock you didn't elaborate at all on the back end of that, did you? No. Okay. If you answered this already, I apologize for asking it again. How long did uh, Alex and Zach live in the log cabin? They lived there from May of 2015 um, until February of 2019, at which point our middle daughter and her husband moved in and lived there until we sold the property. Okay. Which again was when, 2019? Correct.
You were asked by Member Kramer again about your hours of operation at page 26 of the transcript. He said, so your hours actually of operation could change because if you're going to have a wedding at noon, the caterer will probably be in there setting up something around 9 in the morning. And you said, yes, that's true. And it's hard to argue <laughs> with that response. But you were asking about hours of operations changing. You didn't mention anything about extending it out or the duration of events going further into the evening, did you? No. Okay. All right. And again, you were, if I understood correctly, you were making the best anticipated guess of what you thought your operations may look like. That's correct. And what would actually be happening at the site. Well, can I just clarify what you, the, no. Uh, if your council wants you to. Me for a question. Okay. There's been much to be made about whether or not the discussion of weddings also means receptions. And I, I, I say that in the context of um, th there's been some issue made about the indoor conduct of receptions and the outdoor conduct of weddings. Um, Mr. Do you recall Mr. Bauhoff telling the board on March 24, 2015, as far as events go, the wedding season is somewhat limited. Outdoor weddings from May to October. Yes, I do remember that. Right. And he specifically said outdoor weddings. This is at page 31 of the transcript. There's no mention of receptions. And there's been some distinction drawn in the testimony here between weddings and receptions. Why, why was there no additional information provided about the conduct of the receptions I can't answer that is could it simply be you hadn't thought that through I I don't I don't recall I, I don't want to put words in your mouth but no. I'm saying I, I'm 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 getting the impression that in 2015 you were giving the board your best idea of what you were going to be doing on the property Correct. That was seven years ago. Things change, don't they? Absolutely. Yeah. When you were asked about And bear with me. You were asked about how many people, uh, by Member Kramer on page 23, um, how many people are you able to serve in your country in, and will any, and, and will any one particular function? I think that's maybe a, a, an error in transcription, and with any one particular function. But be that as it may, your answer was up to 100. Do you recall that? I do recall that. Okay. And do you recall making any clarification? Yes. About, let me finish the question. Oh, sorry. <laughs> about how many people you're intending to host outdoors? No. Okay. So that was the only number that was out in front of the board. It, it, from, from your recollection, is that right? There was an, an example in there of a number of 75. Number of 75. But other than that, there wasn't any indication that indoors we've got 100. Outdoors we've got room for 200 people. There was nothing like that, was there? No.
and there was no discussion about amplified um, music or broadcast coming from the site during the um, the outdoor events. There was no discussion about noise or music so or whatever, anything. Was there? No. Well, there was the discussion of the noise ordinance, and uh, was I aware of it? Mm -hmm. And that you'd have to comply? Correct. With an ordinance that's not being enforced, as it turns out. With your indulgence? the tent was erected when no. your the plans were submitted to the board. Um, we looked at them earlier. If Mr. Kippard can convince the mouse to go to app plans PDF, you'll see below the trees near the top of the diagram there is something called a gazebo. Do you see that? Yes, that's existing. Okay. This is not a site plan. I get that. This, this is just a drawing of the existing property. Right. And this was submitted in connection with your application? Correct. Okay. Well, I, I understand that. Okay. <laughs> is there any indication on there of the tent? This is just existing. There was no existing tent there. This is just what's on the property when we bought the property and when we submitted the but there was no testimony in March 2015 about a tent was there there was n not a tent specifically what specifically was there was some discussion about an outdoor facility but I don't I didn't see it in there it just says it's inaudible no structural elements or anything like that was discussed like I said, I recall, because that was always our intention, of that there would be a structure. I do not see it in the testimony. Okay. Why, why would you not testify to that uh, if it was always something you were planning? I did. The improvement of the I, recalled, I recall it, but it's not in there. There's a lot in here that says inaudible, and I believe it was when Mr. Bayhoff said something about not building something and then there was a clarification, and it says it's inaudible. So I'm assuming that's when I said something about it, but I can't be for, you know, sure of that either. Okay. But there's no mention of it in the board's findings as part of their decision for March either. So, I, I mean... The findings were for... Uh, a country inn with a catering facility. Exactly. That's correct. That's all that the finding was. Okay. Is there a reason why those details weren't discussed? Or was it just something you had been thinking of but hadn't arrived at a firm? Illusion about. I'm just going to interject here. I believe that she has testified that she did testify at the 2015 hearing about outdoor facilities and that it's reflected in the transcript as inaudible. So I think this is asked and answered at this point. But the only, let me ask you this the outdoor facilities that you referenced, because there doesn't appear to be any discussion about anything in particular. The only outdoor facilities existing that you showed in your submission in support of your application, which is on the screen now, 
is a gazebo, a main house, a cabin. I mean, are, are they, isn't that, is that what you submitted? This is a drawing of the property that existed. It wasn't to show what we were planning on doing. That was for the, we were told Why we submitted that with the site plan. Why Any, did you not submit a plan showing construction for what you were going to do? Excuse me. I'm not really sure how I can answer it any differently. I mean, when we were required to okay. submit the site plan, we submitted it with the proposed tent on it. Okay. Which had not been shown previously with what you submitted to the board as part of your application. I guess not. No, I have no idea. It's if that's, like I said, that is just a drawing of what exists supposedly. I understand. <laughs> <coughs> I'm not sure really what goes into the packet. With the board's indulgence. I'm going to show you something that's been marked for identification, or will be marked for identification, mm -hmm. as number nine. Ten. Ten. And ask if you can identify what that is. This is the original, the very first, I believe, site plan that was submitted for approval. Okay. And it's a simple... Oh, okay, so the second one, the second one. <laughs> Are there any markings across the bottom of it with dates? Yes. And can you tell us what those are? 2-22-2016. Okay, and it's uh, Jay Voigt, Zoning Administrator, and Clay Black from Development Review, correct? That's correct. They signed off on the simplified site plan. Yes, they did. And as you indicate, well, let me withdraw that. In the purpose note, mm -hmm. it says no rooms, no rooms will be available for rent. Correct. Why was that included on that? I do not know. All right. And this seems to show a formal garden arrangement? That's correct. Okay. And the proposed tent right here. Okay. Is that the proposed tent that's shown on the current site plan? That is correct. It is? What's the, what's the dimensions of that first tent? This tent? This tent? I don't know, you tell me, I can't see it. Okay. <laughs> I'm gonna offer this as 10. Okay. Recall, 
on exhibit number 10. There's a formal garden, at least in part, in the location where the tent is located now, correct? That was not an existing formal garden, no. Okay. That was a planned okay. that we were planning on doing. Right. And to be used as a facility for outdoor events? Correct. Okay. So the 80... 50 by 80 or whatever it is um, tent that's shown on the current simplified site plan didn't even come up or wasn't even contemplated until sometime after 2016. I don't know what the size was though on that one. Yeah, there was a proposed tent on there. Not the one that's there now. That is correct. Okay. And I was advised to submit a new site plan because the tent was not where we said it was going to be. Were you advised to come back to the board? Excuse me? Were you advised to come back to the board for purposes of modifying your conditional use approval? No. I have no further questions for this witness. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. You're welcome. Some okay. brief, I'm sorry. Go ahead, some uh, brief redirects. Yes, sir. Uh, so on the, uh, it was appellant's 10? Yes. On appellant's 10, there was a notation um, that you were asked about that said, no rooms will be available for rent. Um, did you type that notation onto that simplified site plan? Did you personally? No, yes. No, I did not. Okay. And did you ask whoever prepared that site plan to type that notation onto the site plan? No. Do you have any idea why that notation was made onto the site plan? I have no idea. And indeed, you were aware that rooms being available for rent was a requirement for the conditional use approval as a country inn. Yes, I and did. During your operation of the business, you indeed did have rooms available for rent. Isn't that right? Yes. And that notation was later removed. Isn't that correct? That's correct. And that was removed at your request, at the county's request, both requests, what? Uh, both requests. Okay. Um, I'm going to show you uh, what will be marked as uh, Pelley's one. Can you identify this document for me? This is the, the next iteration. It's got two copies on each one. The board. Oh, this is the um, amended site plan dated, I believe it's January 4th, 2017, uh, where the tent was relocated about 50 feet. And again, could you des describe for the board why this this iteration of the site plan was necessary. That is, um, who requested that you modify your site plan? Um, Clay Black. And why was that modification requested? Um, because the tent was not in the same place that we had placed it on the original site plan. It was about 50 feet back. And you would submit we will accept that into evidence. <clears throat> so just so the board is clear in terms of the timing, Appellant 10 was the initial approved site plan. Correct. And Appellees 1, this site plan, was the second approved site plan. Correct. And the purpose of that was to 
um, show the correct location of the tent. That's correct. I know that I'm going to be testing your powers of recollection and we've all poured over this transcript many times by this point, but you recall some discussion of outdoor facilities during the 2015 testimony, isn't that right? Yes. And could you say a bit more about that for the board, what, that, what your recollection of those statements were? Um, I just remember their conversation about being asked if um, we would also do outdoor um, events by one of the members, and I said yes. And um, also uh, Mr. Bayhoff talking about the beauty of the property and the aesthetics of it, and that there's you know the availability to do events outside as well. Uh, and there was discussion about. Um, the arbor as well as the pavilion wasn't that right yes that's correct okay. um, and i believe you were asked you know how many people you would have working to set up outside functions do you recall that yes and, and your response i believe was as many as needed isn't that correct that's correct <laughs> And just to be abundantly clear with respect to um, the app plans as it's titled on the the screen here, what what does this drawing represent again? Uh, it represents the property when we first looked at it. Okay. So d anywhere on this, does that show uh, any of your... Uh, plans with respect to improvements, repairs, any sort of business no. implementation at no. all, right? The bulk of that was provided within the, the testimony and then the site plans that were submitted for approval. Isn't that correct? Correct. No further questions. Board members, question of Ms. Snyder's testimony. I do have one. Mr. Snyder, and before, we, before you start, the Snyders are not related here. I just want that out there in with the same Mark first Snyder and last Mark name. Snyder, but anyway. exactly. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Chairman, for bringing that up. Um, I don't want to beat the tent to death. I'm just trying to understand it because I've re I've seen the video, I've read the the testimony, to the t the transcript, and notwithstanding your recollection. Um, was there any direct testimony that spoke to an outside facility, tent, or structure? And I preface that by saying that anything I recall reading was Mr. Bauhoff saying that no additional structures were being built. Now, so can you help me with that? Yeah, I don't recall any testimony being specific about a tent being put up. Is, is that what you're asking me? Yeah. Yeah, I do not recall specifically. Or any, out, any type of structure or anything like that whatsoever. Do you remember any specific testimony affiliated with that? No. Okay. When, you, when the tent was erected or built, were you required to get a building permit for that? Yes, every year. So then, okay. So you've answered my question. Thank okay. you very much. I have a question. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Snyder, um, could you tell me when you sold the property? August 2019. August 2019. So you were part of the, the group that were dealing with a simplified site plan dated uh, April 26, 2019. That's correct. Okay. The uh, you In your testimony, you were talking about the uh, gravel drive, uh, sorry, the gravel driveway. I need to have lunch, I think. Um, how long is it? How long is it? Yes. 
I do not know that. How wide is it? I don't know that either. <laughs> okay. Um, I have a question concerning the initial site plan. It's dated August 20th, 2015. Yeah, the hearing uh, 5822 was held on 32415. So that site plan wasn't in the possession of the BZA at that time. No, you're required six months after you're approved to submit your site plan. Okay, so what was in possession of the board at that time was this initial submission. Is that correct? I, yes. Your, the, uh, on square paper hand drawing. Yes, just a submission of the what the property looks like. Right, but it doesn't show any property boundaries on here. And the impression I get when you when looking at this, my first impression, and this is my observation, is that it shows 425 feet along the, as, you know, from between two arrowheads. The property is actually 456 feet. The uh, shows the pine trees, and the impression is it's inside your property. It's actually not your property. It's actually the Libby's property. Is that correct? That's correct. Right. So um, I also got the impression from the discussion in the uh, transcript that the pine trees were important but you couldn't guarantee therefore because they're not yours that they would still be there to protect the neighbors from noise is that correct that's correct okay. but we did always have mr lippy's permission to we would always ask permission first if to but trim up the trees or take that care. Is mr lippy's decision whether or not to keep the trees there correct that is correct okay, thank you mr simmons uh, the only thing I think was the question I had in my mind was the, the graph paper drawing is an indication of what was there that and you had six months to get the simplified site plan into the county so this this was not a site plan you didn't do a preliminary site plan the Carroll Land Service at that point had not drawn anything up no okay any other questions board members at this point in time, it's um, 1230. 12.30. We're going to go ahead and adjourn the hearing and come back at 1.30. Okay? Thank you. Thank you.
Okay, we'll go ahead and call the BZA meeting back to order. Um, I believe you're going to call your second witness. Is that where we're at in the proceedings? You would be correct. So I do have one brief preliminary. Uh, my my first witness, Jen Snyder, actually was able to pull up a, a blown up version of what was appellant's 10. I believe 10. Right. And so I, I just wanted to supplement fingers. Right, <laughs> supplement the record with this blown up version of the, the same document. Um, there was a little bit of heartburn about um, not being able to answer what was the dimensions of the tent. She just couldn't make it out. Um, okay, so so do you, you, you want to go ahead and recall her some, based on the new evidence? Okay, you can I, go ahead and do that. I have no objection to it coming in if he wants to avoid recalling her. I'll stipulate to what it is. Okay. That's, that's fine with me. Yeah. So this is going to be appellants or appellees two. You're going to get that back. <laughs> that no way of... <clears throat> we might need that one back. You might. They won't give it back to us. <laughs> That's our only yeah. copy copy. So, <clears throat> Mr. Bowersox, would, would, without objection, can we look at this and give it back to them since it's already in the record in a different size? Yes. Okay. And Does that alleviate your heartburn? Yes. Okay. We can keep it. I mean. Well, that's their only copy. Oh, their only copy. That, and I said we've already. Well, this is a this is not a accurate, not a current one. Could engineering or development was, review make this a copy? This was the one that they were asking about the dimensions of the building. And she said she couldn't answer. The dimensions of the tent are not on there because the tent's not shown. So the, actually, the tent is on there. Um, yeah. So it was pointed out right here. So you've got this existing. 50 by 35, 5. And then the no. proposed tent. Oh, yeah. Proposed tent. OK. Well, the 50 sorry. by 35 is got it. You got it. Right. 50, 50, 50 by 80, 10. 50 by 80, 10. <clears throat> Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I see it. Okay. Okay. Very good. Thank. May I? Thank you for bringing something here that we could actually see. Yes. No problem. May I see that one, one more time? Question based on that. Thing. Fifty by eighty ten. What's that? What's that mean? That's that's what is that's what was not decipherable on this. Eighty is that eighty point one zero? Fifty. What it was? What's the? I don't understand <clears throat> eighty ten. 50 by 80, 50, uh, 50 feet by 80 foot tent is delineated on that. Okay. It's also on exhibit 10. That that's that's a blown up version of exhibit 10. Correct. Um, I'm not sure it is. Can I see this again? It's not 10 because uh, our original yeah, site. You guys are the one. Here, here. Uh, Where's 10? Guess this back to Where's 10? Mr. Dixon. The only difference between the two would have been the garden. So whatever you introduced with the garden on it, I don't remember which number no, that was. Yeah. Just one second. Yeah. What's the date on that? One thirteen. No. I have this, but it's. That's from our building premise, but it's not the whole thing. It's a zoom thing. Yes, it's an overlay of the existing. We're waiting for them right. to make a decision whether so it is the same as. That's what this is. That was not, right. Okay. <clears throat> do, do we concur that it's, and, and what exhibit is this for the record? This is a blown up version of which map? 10. 10. 10. <clears throat> do you want to swap out this for 10 or? Okay. Well, no, just as long as we, as long as as long as legal counsel both sides concurs that that is <clears throat> two is an enlarged version of ten of appellees two 
is an enlarged version of Appellant's 10. Okay, but he didn't enter that into evidence. We're, we're, I have no objection to it coming into evidence. Okay, but the, 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 there's a concern that that's the only copy there, and that's why I made the, wanted to make sure legal counsel agreed that that was the same thing as 10. And that, because the- Without the, introducing it into Without the, introducing it. I understand. Be, because the, quite frankly, we could not decipher uh, what was asked of uh, Mrs. Snyder in cross-examination. Right. Understood. The okay. dimensions of the tent, which are now on the record as 50 by 80. 50 by 80 is, was the <clears throat> question that was asked of Mrs. Snyder. She couldn't answer that based on uh, Exhibit 10, but with a blown up version, mm -hmm. we've, we've determined that that's what the size of the building is. Okay? I think we've gotten there. Mr. Caldwell, did you have any? I had a question for you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, but that's not what we're talking about. We're, this isn't 10. This is the one after. I know, but this. Well, this, this you have to have to ask that question. I don't know. <laughs> okay, with that, Mr. Caphart, would you like to call your second witness? Yes, please. So I would call Mark Snyder. Um, Mark, could you please state your name, address, and occupation for the record, please? Do, put that microphone back. Put put it move it back to where it was. Okay, very good. Now just speak oh. into the you don't have don't you don't have to get this close to it. Okay. Just speak loudly into it. Okay, we we have different issues with you and your legal counsel. Your legal counsel is not quite loud enough, but uh, Mrs. Snyder was loud enough. Okay. <laughs> so you're assuming I'm going to be loud enough to? <laughs> yes. So Mark Snyder S N Y D E R, not the Mark Snyder of the BZA board. Uh, Three six one zero three Bonefish Court, Lewis, Delaware. Okay, and Mr. Snyder, you are married to Mrs. Snyder, who was just testified. Yes. And so part of your family business was you were a partner in the Royer House LLC, is that correct? It was a woman-owned business, so I was just okay, so silent. You, you were an employee then, correct. so to speak. Uh, and what was your role within the business? I was pretty much the groundskeeper, parking attendant, noise monitor, just about all of the odd jobs that didn't have direct bearing on either the uh, um, country in or the wedding por portion. Great. Uh, so uh, one of the issues that the Hicks has with the Royer House operation is um, the amplified music and noise. Would you agree? Um, as I stated, yes. And uh, when did you first become aware of the Hicks um, noise complaints? Um, truthfully, we, we were, you know, continuously addressing the, you know, the sound emanating from the facility from day one. Um, sometimes I was shocked to know that we'd have somebody come to the event that would be a so, Mr. Please. Snyder, I'm just going to stop you. We'll get to the measures okay. that you took, but when did you first become aware of the, the Hicks complaints about the noise? I, I think uh, probably when, when Brad mentioned it. Okay. And do you recall about when that was? Again, I, I realize that this is testing the powers of memory. I really don't have a date. Okay. Um, so, can you just tell the board a bit about the efforts that you personally undertook in order to um, deal with the the noise emanating from the property sure um, as I mentioned we we started pretty much from day one um, consulting to the, the noise ordinance it was always a little bit of a of an issue because we were a commercial property uh, abutting an agricultural property but con potentially impacting residential so we you know when I say we when I when I would monitor stuff I would always just resort to the residential code as far as decibel readings that no, I'm just going to stop you there because I want to be clear what is the the code that you're referencing let me get to it
This this code is, uh, I guess it's Carroll County. I could get to the beginning of it, but it's uh, statute 146.3 noise generation and vibration limits, land use specific limits. So would it be fair to state that the code you're referencing is the Carroll County noise ordinance? Correct. Okay. Um, please continue to tell the board about your efforts to, to minimize the amount of noise. So um, as I mentioned, there's a, a lot, there's a day night, there's an industrial, commercial, residential, and the limits are all slightly different because of the use. And as a result, we defaulted to the lowest level, uh, potentially impacting something residential next to us or the closest, even though we didn't abut a residential. All right, Mark, just to, again, clarify for the board when you say the lowest level do you mean the the lowest limit of noise is it the most restrictive yes the 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 most restricted of the limits so during the daytime it would show 65 decibels and at nighttime that would drop down to 55 decibels please continue okay um and and we did that initially um through you know until we could get a hold of what we purchased were two professional decibel readers but until then like maybe like the first wedding or so before we had those in our hand I was using a couple of different phone apps that uh, proved to be very accurate when in, in retrospect I went back and checked them against the decibel readers and they showed almost identical um, so with that I would always and first address the DJs when they'd show up we had a strict limit that said no subwoofers because that's the noise that tends to travel the most. So we made sure that if they brought them because the bride miscommunicated, that they put them back on their trailer and they didn't show up. Um, second part of that was we talked about the limits, what they were and what they were at our lot line, what they were up on the top of the hill, potentially next to the Hicks or any of the other abutting properties and where they needed to be in the tent to satisfy that as far as a reading. So um, somewhere in there, we uh, invited a, a sound professional out um, and uh, named Scott Albin. He's a, a professional DJ and he, and he does you know other sound uh, equipment uh, um, profiles, but he came out and we ran sound checks through the, through the tent and we tried to uh, do some some mitigating stuff to minimize the amount of noise that would leave the area. And when we did that, um, that's when we discovered the noise of about yeah, somewhere around 90 decibels in the tent would leave us at about 55 at the boundary line. And if I walked all the way up to the top of the farm lane, I was well down into the 40s. So um, with that said, um, we did do some other, you know, types of mitigation that we attempted anyways to see if changing stuff within the speakers, height of the speakers, direction of speakers, any of that would change what we were able to monitor at the, uh, at the lot line. And, and realistically, um, we came up with speaker placement was about the only uh, thing that helped. So we, we tended to make sure that we had speakers that were um, directionally towards the, the house and, and not outside the, you know, the tent, um, which once again, I mean, other than some echo bounce back that you would get off of anything was uh, as much of a, you know, a mitigation factor as almost turning them down. But we did constantly monitor. I've got videos on my phone continuously about every half hour once, uh, once we started into uh, the, the reception part of uh, what the, the sound levels were, time, date, and pictures. And um, it really, you know, with very few uh, excursions, um, other than maybe like a cheer of a crowd or something on a specific song, um, we were always within the limits. And if we weren't, you know, if it, if it did ex go over the legal limit at our lot line, which was still going to be a lot less up on top of the hill, we immediately, and when I say we, I, went in and addressed the DJ and said, hey, it needs to, it needs to go down. 
as far as the, the overall volume. So. And can you describe for the board any other measures you would take with respect to the sound and the time of day? What I mean is, were you monitoring sound differently for, say, early afternoon as opposed to nighttime? We did, um, and once again, the, the, the limits that we set were towards the low end, so we tried to you know, stay within uh, a, a limit. Obviously, at nighttime, once it got dark, was when the limits changed from 65 down to 55. So, um, you know, if there wasn't a direct correlation between what I was reading and what was legal, we immediately said, hey, listen, it's, it's nighttime. We need to turn, turn down the volume now. Now, once again, I mean, I would typically walk to the top of the hill, you know, every other hour or so, or at least halfway up the hill to see where at the edge of, at that point, the only neighbor that really was abutting to the farm lane was the Hicks property. So I would, without going on their property, walk to the edge of it and measure it there or walk to the top of Beggs Road and measure it there. And once again, it was minimal, almost to the point where it was conversationally quiet, per se. And so the process that you've just described for the board, is that something that you would undertake for every other event, every event? No, it was, I mean, it was every event. Um, and, and we knew as, you know, going into this that uh, you know, one of the biggest issues that we had was trying to be good neighbors, and we were doing everything that we could to attempt that. And that meant, in my mind, the one thing that was truly that was outside of you know the purview in the tent and of the wedding party was noise. And that's where you know we saw that we needed, or at least me, spent uh, you know a majority of my time and. Um, like I said, it was it was a constant trying to make sure that we had noise at levels that were acceptable at our lot lines. Now, you've, you've mentioned the, the tent a few times as well as the placement of speakers within the tent. Is there a reason that you would place the speakers within the tent or even within a certain area of the tent? Um, you know, realistically, it was just uh, for some of the sound damping that uh, where um, panels were. We decided early that um, we, we kept the back panels of the tent continuously down. We never opened them because that's the side of the tent that would open up up the hill. Um, and there were times that, you know, some of the best sound dampening past the tent was what the Lippy Brothers would plant. You know, if we had if we had corn, it was you know just a maze run through there for sound, and it just dampened everything. If they had you know green beans or soy, then it wasn't so high, and we had to uh, you know make sure that all of the all of the sound emanating from the tent was at a lower volume. So, I, I mean, as far as that goes, yeah, the speaker placement became something that we tried to to dictate and. You know, some of it would depend on where the dance floor was, and and but we still were fairly, you know, emphatic with the DJs. It's like, okay, hey, listen, we've got chords. You can reach power here, here, here. This is where we need these. Uh, now, with respect to cutting off sound or the end of operations, can you describe for the board what you would do in terms of you know events ending time? Well, we we give them a uh, a heads up. We always had uh, alarms set on uh, phones, watches, and, and I'd make sure that they knew that the sound had to be down because, uh, you know, for us it was a dull roar. I mean, so literally like 44 decibels um, at 10 o'clock. So I'd give the, the DJs a 10 minute prior and say, listen, your last song ends in 10 minutes. It's got to be done and you know no last oh yeah we need one more song it's 10 minutes and you know basically if you're not done at that point you're going to be done because i'm going to click the breaker and and the house lights would come up at 10 and so everybody knew that that part was over 
and and that's how we you know stop the sound at that point did you indeed ever have to flip the breaker on somebody to I shut did, them down we did not um did not i think a lot of that just had to be you know uh, a lot of conversation ahead of time making sure that they knew we were in a rural area the sound did travel and you know it, it wasn't something that was going to be you know perfectly quiet I mean, it would be nothing different than what we could do if we were just homeowners out there as far as making noise, um, as far as the levels allowed by the noise ordinance. Just as, as a business, as we mentioned, we wanted to set that example. And, uh, you know, once again, we, we mitigated everything to the, to the level that we could, and we think that we succeeded in keeping the noise coming out of the tent at, at the proper level. Uh, was part of your duties um, with Royer House uh, setting up and taking down the tent? Um, no, I mean, we actually contracted out to have somebody set up the tent. Are, are you familiar with that process? Yes. Okay. And you observed it? Yes. Um, so is the tent, the tent is not a, a permanent fixture on the property? It is not. Um, it can be fully taken down? It could. Um, and removed and stored? I guess it could. As um, a matter of fact, I mean, half of it was taken down. All of the skin was taken down every year to get stored and cleaned. Okay. Um, did you have any other um, specific requirements? I believe a, a board member had asked earlier whether a building permit was required for the tent. Is that it correct? Was. It was. Okay. And, and did that building permit that you received, that was a, a county permit? Correct. Um, and is that something that you had to keep up with on an annual, semi-annual basis? Yeah, once a year. Okay. And how long, uh, or let me ask you a more general question, um, were there any conditions on that building permit for the tent? There were. Um, the conditions for us were uh, typically, uh, you know, six months, half of a year, and, and that's where the county wanted to have a, a start date and an end date um, as far as when, when we were going to put the, you know, the skin back on, when it was going to come down. And, uh, you know, once again, early on, we didn't have as many exact dates, but we didn't need to because it wasn't a full six months um, cycle. Uh, later on, where we would program weddings out in the future a little bit further, we were at, you know the, the dates were a lot more pinpointed, and we didn't have to you know give up you know a couple of weeks either side just for you know because we didn't know when the weddings were coming in. Um, were you also responsible for um, parking at events? I was. And how did you typically handle parking? Um, well. Basically, parking was uh, something that happened from from the minute the wedding party started. We wanted to make sure we got their stuff organized and out of the way. And every every time we parked, we we would set up a, a corral to try to get cars in so that they could get back out as as easy as possible. Um, so we'd have somebody that would meet them, as Jen mentioned, at the uh, intersection to be able to direct them down the parking lane. And then from there, we'd have somebody that would point either right or left to go up and they'd pull in and they'd come up to a rope and that's where they would stop. And then we continued around to the other side to be able to fill in the spots. And, and a lot, most of the weddings, it wasn't quite as critical um, just due to the number of cars that, that would you know show up, how many people would come in each car. I have no further questions. Mr. Bauer Sox, you have questions of Mr. Snyder? Yes, I do. Thank you very <laughs> much. <clears throat> Mr. Snyder, good afternoon. Much of your testimony had to do with noise mitigation. Can you tell me um, what qualifications Scott Alban has? I could, uh, if, if I could call him, I could probably get his uh, information, but other than that, a professional sound. You don't uh, know? Not at this time, I don't. Okay. And do you have any background in acoustical engineering? No, sir. All right. Um, when did you buy the two meters? 
professional meters? I, I don't have that date in front of me. Do you still have them? I do not. Okay. And you were using phone apps before? Uh, yes, very briefly. Do you know what kind of phone apps? They were? What were the phone apps? Uh, there was one, I believe it was called Decibel X, and another one that was, as I mentioned, readily, readily available. Okay. Now, did you take a reading? I, I, you may have testified to it. If you did, I didn't catch it. I'm sorry. Did you take a reading for every occasion you had receptions and amplified music? Yes. Every one? Yes. Okay. Did you take decibel readings at the Hicks property or the boundary of the Hicks property for every one? Yes. You did? Well, at the boundary, yeah. That's only the okay. boundary, the far uh, southeast corner uh, at the bottom of, you know, the uh, farm row. Yes. Okay. And you said that sound would decrease at the top of the hill. Isn't that right? Yeah, the sound would typically decrease, you know, by feet walking away from the tent. So, okay, and um, sound is also affected by other meteorological and atmospheric effects, is it not? Sure. Okay. You said you knew going in to it, the, I presume you mean the venture, um, that you needed to be good neighbors which is, I mean, I, I understand that. And you testified about a great deal of steps you took to monitor and attempt to mitigate noise emanating from the property. Correct? Yep. And is this a feature of the activities that was always contemplated? I don't understand your question. Is this a feature, excuse me, is this a feature of the activities on site that you were contemplating when you came into the board to ask for the original conditional use permit? You mean as far as if there would be music? Music. At every wedding I've ever been to, there's okay. been music. So Amplified I would assume music? that we were having music. Okay. And you didn't mention anything about that to the board in 2015 when you came in? that there was going to be music at a wedding amplified music i am uh, assuming that uh, it was either not asked as a question or not answered but you're the uh, you're the applicant you have to provide the information about the scope of your use why would you not mention that apparently you knew you had to be good neighbors going into it um, a lot of things you certainly took great efforts uh it seems to try to mitigate um why not let the genie out of the bottle up front there was no you know uh, intent to hide anything as far as yeah i mean we were asked about noise ordinances and we answered it mm -hmm. so i mean obviously noise has to come from something right and, but you didn't volunteer anything about the operation. I'm, I'm not quite sure I understand. You didn't mention to the board that part of your activities would involve, after the weddings ending at 5, outdoor receptions that could go on until 10 o'clock at night and involve amplified music. Once again. I didn't see anything in the record. Do you remember anything in the record about that? I do not remember anything in the record about that, but there was a lot of other minutia that wouldn't have been covered in such a small time frame as we were allowed when we first met with the board. So I don't know that. So you're relying on the board to assume you knew what you wanted to not do? Not at all. I'm assuming that, if anything, that they'd been to a wedding and they knew that there would be music. Does every wedding reception feature amplified music? Every wedding I've been to has. Okay. How about you? Uh, no. Okay. No. Um, about music? Sometimes no. Okay. 
then I understand, and I apologize for what? asking out of turn. You said that you said that you found the the acoustical levels conversationally quiet correct yes what is the tent made of vinyl vinyl okay. um, you testified that the tents taken down every year but are the supports left up when the tent skin comes off they are okay So in terms of, you say you mitigated everything you could do, or you, you mitigated, yes, you mitigated everything you could do. Did you ever consider limiting the hours for the amplified music? Or did you ever consider having unamplified acoustic music as a requirement? Not specifically. The 10 minute deadline you gave the DJ was 10 minutes before 10 p.m., correct? Typically, yes. And was this the kind of activity you were anticipating when you wanted to open this venue? No. You weren't anticipating? We did not necessarily have a, a, a hard time set up as far as that. I mean, if somebody ended at nine, their 10 minutes prior would have been at nine. Did most of them end at 10? Um, I mean, as far as a percentage, I'd say 50%. Uh, okay. So a substantial number of them, if it's half. I have no further questions at this time. Board members, questions of Mr. Snyder's. Go I, ahead, Mr. Colbell. Uh, Mr. Snyder, you uh, mentioned that you had measured the audio levels and you said it was 90 dB in the tent. It's, I said at 90 dB in the tent, it provided 55 dB at the lot line. So is this 90 dB the, the average level of the music in the no. tent? we would always tell the DJs that we would, you know, we knew that specifically, that's what I went over when I went over it with Mr. Alban, that that would be the level. So we always told the DJs we needed it no higher than 80 to 85 in the tent, which well, no, would significantly reduce what we'd see at the lot line. That's, that's possibly true. However, you know, recommended numbers for uh, audio levels in the open air around 70 and above that causes permanent damage to hearing if you're left exposed to that level of noise so for, I'm surprised for an extended I'm amount of time high. correct yes so because every every 10 db is a factor of of uh, 100 you can uh, really rack up the noise yes. the other question i have is concerning the 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 vinyl on the tent is that a taut structure in terms of is it tight over the surface yes so it acts like an eardrum uh, to some extent I suppose you might think so but I mean that the, the, the surface that's mostly taut is the roof and then the sides are all side curtains that have you know ripple to them even if you know when they're tied closed well, essentially you, you if it's a taut surface it does create an eardrum effect so the sound is passed straight through the um, other th thing I'm concerned about was you'd mentioned that you pointed the speakers towards the house. The house is made of brick, correct? 
uh, some of it, yes. Right, so it reflects the sound off there also. In the, in the direction of the house, not away from the house was the point. No. We're not pointing them at the front porch or the main body of the house. We're pointing them in the direction where that is. Is it off to the side into trees or actually at the house itself? It could be, you know, I, I, I'd be micromanaging. I don't know exactly where they were, but I mean, the, the side of the house was easier, you know, to aim at. I mean, if you're asking whether some of that may have bounced off the house, I would say probably. Yes, the answer would be yes. But then, again, that's why we continuously measured it. Okay. All right, so... Um, I have no further questions at this time. Thank you. Mr. Snyder, you don't want to ask Mr. Snyder any questions? Pass. <clears throat> Mr. Simmons? No. I have no questions. Okay, you want to call your next witness? Yes, please. Um, Are you done? Yeah, you guys can. Oh, yeah. Um, so, the Snyders have come all the way from Delaware today. Are, can they, they be excused? No, no objection. I'm not going to recall. I'm not going to call them on my own. I have no objection if they want to. If, if, if there's no objection from uh, from yes. I, I will say I'm going to I, I'm going to offer some rebuttal testimony to Mr. Snyder's um, testimony, but um, just as notice. But if they are inclined to leave, I don't have any objection to that. Okay. Um. That's fine. Okay. So, with, without objections, the Snyders are dismissed. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate all your gentlemen time. All right. Okay, Mr. Kephart, you want to call your next witness? Yes, it's going to be um, Robert Bryan. Good afternoon. Bob, if you could just state your name, address, and occupation for the board, please. My name is Robert Ryan, R-Y-A-N. My address is 431 Fortress Way, Occoquan, Virginia, 22125. I work for the Department of D uh, DOD, uh, Headquarters Department of the Army. I'm a senior policy and doctrine writer. Now, Mr. Ryan, when did you purchase um, the property in question? In August of 2019. And as part of that purchase, you also uh, sort of piggybacked onto the conditional use that was requested by the Snyders. Is that correct? Yes, that transferred with the property. And you set up a new LLC. What is the name of that LLC? The Christian Warrior House. And you, LLC. and you have continued to operate, for lack of a better term, the Royer House. Um, much in the same way as the Snyders, is that correct? That is correct. Okay. And what can you describe for the board are your roles within the, the business? I do the parking, like Mark Snyder did. I also do the sound control and just basic maintenance and monitoring the entire event to make sure everything goes smoothly. Um, so we just heard Mr. Snyder's testimony with respect to how he would monitor and attempt to minimize the amount of noise emanating from the property. What efforts um, have you made since um, your ownership of the property? We pretty much continued the same thing when um, Mark Snyder stated he no longer had those professional acoustic meters. That's because I have them now. I have two of those. I have two different apps on my phone. Every half hour to an hour, I'm out there at the property line measure, measuring the music level. Um, rarely have I ever had to tell them to turn it down. When they get, and it's spiking over 60, I will walk down and tell them that we don't want to touch 65 and then turn it down the tent. Um, we usually have about 85 decibels inside the tent, which I've found to be the same thing. And I did multiple uh, alongside ride-alongs with Mark Snyder prior to, prior to taking over the property. 
I've also walked up the hill to, uh, to the roads up there. I've driven around and parked on the roads, and the music is negligible at those distances. <laughs> All right, so you're utilizing the, the professional meters. Um, are you utilizing any other tools to, to measure or, or minimize sound? I have apps on my phone that I monitor it with, but the back side of the tent we keep closed. And then we have had two occasions where they requested this back side to be open because they want the beauty of the, the property there. And then I've gone to the DJ and said, you're, you're taking down another five notches on decibels. And I still monitor it. I monitor it more closely when that's open to make sure nothing is... Uh, above the allowable levels. And, and this monitoring procedure, is this something that you're undertaking for, for every event? Every single event. Um, are you also um, monitoring or restricting where um, DJs can set up? Yes, the DJs are on the back side of the tent uh, where we have solid curtain panels instead of the cathedrals of glass with the plastic you can see through. And when, like I said, we keep those closed. The speakers must be in one spot. They must be facing into the tent away from the, the properties up the hill, the Hicks properties and the others. Okay. Are you also monitoring sound based off of time of day? Yes. And can you describe for the board what your standard operating procedure is with respect to that? Our standard operating procedure is in accordance with the Carroll County Ordinance. At 65 decibels, at your property line, you can go up to 65 decibels till 10 o'clock at night during the Friday and Saturday. We've had a wedding on a Sunday, and of course that's different. That ordinance kicks in at nine o'clock. So we monitor that, we adjust to it, and I'm a little more proactive. Mark said he would talk to the DJs at, at 10 minutes prior. I talked to them before they start. I talked to them an hour prior, half hour prior, and 15 minutes prior. And there was one DJ that did go till 10 o'clock, and it took me about 13 seconds to walk over there and pull the plug. Um, have you also developed a program to essentially vet DJs that use or, or operate at your events? Yes, we have had DJs that uh, we were not fond of. One of them had, nowadays, so the music system has changed. A lot of the DJs have a subwoofer system built into their system. We tell them, I know how to turn it off. Go to your keyboard and turn that off. One DJ did turn it on. We were there within minutes as soon as uh, uh, Linda Leith heard it and I was there, turned it off, cranked it down and he is on a restricted list. We will not allow him back and we told him so. And now when they come in, we have a preferred list of DJs. If they wanna go outside that preferred list, then we're gonna have some deep conversation with them both, you know, months in advance of the event. This is something we just can't allow and we're very on top of it. And, and all of these measures that you're taking, this is all in an effort to, to, again, minimize the amount of sound emanating from the property. Is that correct? Yes, we're very aware of it. And I've gone and talked to several of the neighbors around there also. They have no issues with it. They've never contacted us. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to click back on to the simplified site plan that... Um, is dated 42619. You see that? Yes. Have you seen this um, site plan before? Yes, and the, it's been included in several of these cases. Okay. And this is a document you are familiar with then? Yes. And is this site plan what you currently abide by? Yes, it is. And you are operating all within the confines of what is um, uh, displayed here on the the site plan. Yes, we are. Okay. Uh, you said that you are also responsible for parking management. Yes, I am. Could you describe your procedure for managing parking on the property to the board, please? So when, when the event happens, we have people scattered about that come in with the wedding party earlier to get ready. But the if the wedding is going to be at four o'clock, at three o'clock, I've got to be doing parking full time. Um, Linda's grandson helps me. Can they, it takes two people to do it. One to direct them to the general area where I'm at, and then I specifically tell them where to park and how to pull in. Are you or your business doing anything in terms of directing incoming traffic to um, the proper entrances, exits to the property? No, they come down, 99% of the vehicles come down a normal road. There have been a few sporadic people come down the, the farmer access road. I have dealt with the uh, state ag preserve board representative on that. Because they stated they blocked off the bottom of the property to keep people from doing it. I told the state we were doing that. And they said, we don't have the authority to block it off. 
But since Jen Schneider fixed the Google system, it's just a rare occasion. I think probably we had maybe half a dozen last year come down that road. For those that do come down that road, do you have a conversation with them? Yes, we tell them that's not our land. You, you, I mean, and the thing is you can't prohibit them from coming down the road. The public doesn't have a right to that road, which the state ag preserve says the farmer has a right to block off, but they also are not prohibited from the road or going down the road. And that's the, that's the state ag preserve board rule. So I'm not, I'm not allowed to block it off either, like that Snyder's, that Snyder's did. Also, I have been on the property doing groundwork, general maintenance and labor, and I've seen cars come down that road. And I've went over and said, hey, can I help you? They have, they have nothing to do with the wedding. They're looking for the National Historic Site house. They're, they just see something, they're just driving down a road various times. And they have nothing to do with the wedding venue, nothing to do with the country inn. They're just driving around. Um, so <clears throat> you're aware that as part of the conditional use for a country inn, a manager or owner has to reside on the property. Is that correct? Absolutely. Do you currently have a manager or owner residing on the property? Yes, we do. And who is that? That is Ashley Savina, Linda's daughter. And where does Ashley live on the property? Almost all the time. She, she lives in the main house. That's where her room is. There have been occasions where we have rented out the main house, and she will move to the cabin while the people are in the main house because we have to have somebody on the property. Okay. So Ashley is on the, ha uh, on the property either in the cabin or the house at all times. That is her primary residence. I, I will not say all time. I mean, she's gone on vacation, and I've stayed over on the property myself. I slept in the cabin, I slept in the main house different times, depending on what's rented out. So you, you've mentioned rentals a few times, so another one of the uh, requirements for a country inn is that you have rooms available for rent. Um, do you all have rooms available for rent on the property? We do, and we would like to rent them more often too. We rent them constantly. Um, how many rooms available for rent do you have on the main House. The main house is targeted of five rooms and up to ten people. We've had people request exceptions, but that's, that's the design is five rooms for ten people, and the cabin is for two people. Okay. And if you had to give the board a rough estimate of how often you're renting or, or what percentage of um, the business is through um, rentals, what, what, would, what would your best guess be? Uh, roughly anywhere from 30 to 40 percent of our income comes from the renting of rooms. Um, so that's that's income based, but I mean, how often would you say are, are you renting rooms out? I mean, is, is there someone in there a it, few times a month, once a month? Is it seasonal dependent? Give a board it's, it, some sense of that. It is seasonal. During the ski season, we have skiers rent the room, and they'll come in there with two to four couples. They will rent the room. Um, it's rented in the future for a funeral. Um, we've had another person with a funeral want to put 22 people in there. We've had to reject that. Um, so. We, on average, we probably rent the main house at least once a month and the cabin more often. It's indulgence, one moment. Do you monitor um, the number of attendees for events yes and that's every event every event um, what would you say is the a typical size for let's say a wedding the first year we took over it seemed to be about 130 to 140 then COVID hit and right now we're probably down to 110 to 125 I'd say the average for the whole time is less than 125 uh, about how many weddings or receptions or are you guys um, performing since you took over the business sadly we took over the business right when COVID hit and we've been down my goal is to get up to 24 weddings a year um, the last several years we've had anywhere from 12 to 17 the average of 15 probably a year and that's I think we have 12 or 13 right now on the books for this year um, how many employees do you have working into business we have multiple employees. We have about a dozen total people that we can call up on that come and help. Normally there's about uh, five or six of us there for each event. Um, 
Seven of them come from Linda's family, nieces, daughter, son-in-law. I've got a 22-year-old son, and I also have a, a, a person from work that I can call upon. If we ever get into a pinch and somebody doesn't show up, he, can, he comes up and help, and he's got a 19-year-old son. So there's about a dozen people that we rotate in and out, but consistently anywhere from four to six per wedding. If we go over 125 people, we have six there. If the wedding looks like fairly controlled, we could be down to four people. Um, now, the, the Hicks have registered a, a number of complaints about the sound um, emanating from the property. Have you ever been approached by law enforcement or any county, other county or government official regarding sound complaints? Yes, I have. And do you recall when that, those interactions were? I don't know the exact dates because we're so busy with the weddings, but uh, on multiple occasions the cops will pull up there and say they've got a noise complaint and they will speak to us for a while. You said, you said multiple occasions. About how many occasions have I the police I think I've spoken out? with the cops seven times. And what, how do those encounters go? What's typically said? The, the cops pull up, they listen, they sit outside. I, I'm not, I don't see them pull down the driveway immediately, but since I'm wandering around constantly, I catch them within a few minutes. Um, they'll start talking, say, we, we have a noise complaint. Um, and I'll say, pull out my two professional meters on my phone. I will walk them to the property line and say, you, they're, you're, they're police officers. They know that the sound, county sound ordinance at our property line is 65 decibels. I sit there and let them see three different systems. I will have them take it and walk away from me, and I'll go over here, we'll measure it, and then we'll compare. And they're, they're consistently the same. And then the cops will, I've taken the cops around it and driven up to the roads, and we've been up on Beggs Road and Fridinger Mill Road. We turned the cars off, rolled the windows down, and sat there quietly. You can barely hear anything. And a lot of cops will tell me on the way in, I stopped just to test it. I drove by on Beggs Road, I turned my car off, and it's negligible. So have you ever been cited or fined for the violation of any noise ordinance? No, but one cop did tell me, said, you know, at 10 o'clock, the sound order has changed. I'm like, we're well aware of that. And the music shifts down at 10 o'clock or 9 o'clock during, if it's a weekday. Have you ever been cited or fined for the violation of any law during your operation of the business? No, we have not. Okay. Uh, no further questions. Mr. Bowersox, you have questions of Mr. Ryan's testimony. I do, and thank you, Mr. Bale. Um, Mr. Ryan, good afternoon. How are you doing, sir? Uh, Occoquan, Virginia, you say is your residence 431 Porpoise Way? Fortress Way. Fortress Way, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, I work at the Pentagon. So I'm up here on weekends working, working the place, and during the week, I, I, we have a condo down there. All right, you bought it in 2019? The, the, the Christian Warrior House, we bought it in August, August of 2019. All right. Um, again, there's a lot of testimony about sound control and mitigation of sound control. Um, I'm going to talk to you about some of that. You purchased Mr. Snyder's uh, decibel meters? They were business property and they transferred with the business. What kind are they? I don't know the names of them. How do you take care of calibrating them? They, they come with what they come with. They aren't calibrated. Okay. And you've had occasions to take the, I think you said law enforcement in response to the question, are these people from the sheriff's office that come out? Yes. Okay, Carroll County Sheriff's Office? Yes. And you're taking them out and showing them the decibels, uh, decibel readings um, to try to satisfy them about the noise level? Yes. All right, are you familiar with the report from Sheriff DeWeese that his personnel aren't trained? Yes. Okay. Do you have any background in acoustical engineering? I do not. Okay. You were asked about the site plan, the, 420, the April 26, 2000. Uh, 19 site plan yes and you say you're currently abiding by the site plan correct correct okay and you've been advised that the the driveway uh, or the lippy property is subject to an ag easement yes I've spoken Kim Hawkser from the Ag Preserve of the state has come out there, and I spent two hours there, and she inspected everything. 
Okay. So you, you mentioned um, 12 employees. 12 ro rotating employees there. Rotating employees. They're not all there at the same time, and different sure. ones will show up at different times. How many of those employees are dedicated to the country in? Dedicated is, I don't understand the term of that. How many of them work at the country in? We have uh, the. Linda and I work there every single weekend, and her daughter is full time. So okay. three people are dedicated to it. The other nine are there just for events? Yeah, they're, they're for labor and to do things in events, yes. Okay. And you say 30, 40 percent maybe of your income is from renting uh, rooms at yes, the sir. Country Inn? Yes, sir. How, how many rooms have you rented so far this year? What has been your your rental history this year? Uh, if you count each individual room, because we'll have, for example, uh, McDaniel College, some parent, two parent, sets of parents came from New York to see their, their daughters there. So all four rooms are rented, sometimes five, depending how it is. So if you count the times, I don't know, the main house 40 times, 40 rooms, mm -hmm. the cabin 30 times. But the bulk of your efforts are put into the eventing it sounds like based would, on the number of employees and the amount of income i would not say that well you wouldn't say that but i'm asking you what is 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 that the majority of what you're doing during the weekends when you're coming out no my maintenance just doing different things to keep their property right it's a country and there's maintenance on the building there's maintenance on the ground <coughs> there's all kinds of stuff that has to happen around there But that's stuff that also lends itself to the events, doesn't it? Sometimes it aligns with events, sometimes it does not. When you have a business, whether you're using it for an event or using it for a country, and the appearance of the property, is everything coincides with it. So you could tie them together or you could separate them. That depends on your angle and your view. Did you, did you know you're in the agricultural zone? I'm aware of that. And you say your efforts at mitigation, you've uh, continued basically the same protocols as the Snyders. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Have you ever spoken to the Hicks? No, sir. What neighbors have you spoken to? Uh, this Straight up the hill, as you face from our property east, the Hicks are right up the farm road, right to the right is a, uh, a house. I've spoken with the people there. And if you go straight downstream, there's another property that's as close as the Hicks, probably the same distance, 600, 650 feet. And I've spoken with the people there. They're an older couple live there, and they, they have uh, some kids to take care of there, and I've spoken with them. You're renting five rooms in the main house? As the, hopefully, yes, we hope to rent five rooms. Sometimes we may only rent two rooms, sometimes okay. three. But I hope we, we like to rent five rooms out constantly. And who is the young lady you mentioned that is staying in the cabin? Ashley Savina. Okay. She lives in the main house. I said I stated she lives in the main house. Is that her legal address? Yes. Okay. She's a Maryland taxpayer? She lives with us in our property. That is her residence. That is where she lives. That's there's no, no other no other questions about her. She she lives with us. She's a single mother. Okay. I would like to state something. I just heard Miss Hicks said that she lives in Virginia. That is a lie. No, it is incorrect. That was me asking him a question. Uh, no, there's nothing. In the just just wait answer the question. questions. 
I have no further questions. Board members, Mr. Snyder. No questions for me. I have a question. Go ahead, Mr. Caldwell. Sir, I have a question for you. You said in your testimony you're abiding by the site plan. The site plan uh, that you're referring to is the April 26, 2019 site plan. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay. On that site plan, uh, just below the area of the tent. You want, I can try to blow it up. If you mm -hmm. can. I'll get my hand. Do you need more? So the main house is to the west of the tent. If that helps, sir. Is that sufficient? Excuse me a second. I'll have to go over and have a look at it. Yes, down here it says grass access drive. Okay. We had previous testimony from. You want to get back to the microphone? Uh, Mrs. Snyder, that was gravel. Yes. When they purchased the property, it was a gravel road going back to a little bit beyond the fire pit. Right. That's what she testified to. And uh, if you look at the one of the exhibits we have, which was a shot of the back of the property from Redfin, it showed that that driveway extended well beyond that. Is that Exhibit 9? Exhibit 9? No, Exhibit 8. Exhibit 8. Sorry. Aerial photograph. It's an aerial, uh, a low, low angle aerial I'm photograph. Um, was that driveway there when you purchased the property? Yes, it was. It was there. But that's, that's, if you're abiding by the terms of the, the site plan, that shouldn't be there. The gravel that, is gra be there. that is tire tracks that kills the grass as it goes further back. It's a grass driveway, and when they drive over it so many times, as you follow the line down, it gets more and more grass as you go along. Now, if you look at the, uh, the view, there's a, a marked change in the, when you look at that Exhibit 8, you'll see there's a change in the driveway consistency further down. And if you look at Google Earth, you'll see that actually, as you said, it peters out to dirt right at the far end of the property, something about 400 something feet away from the original entrance. So my concern here is that that's disturbed area and therefore not compliant with the, um, the site plan. You have a, an answer to that? It was like that when we bought the property, sir. Um, there's weeds growing back there. There's grass growing through the tire tracks. We, we did not disturb the property. That was a, an existing road that went back to the fire pit, and then a little bit beyond it, it gets more and more grassy as you move along. When you look at that Exhibit 8 picture, that looks like a um, pretty clean gravel driveway. As far as I'm concerned, so as Jen Snyder testified, there was gravel. It was a gravel road going back past the fire pit, and that was the way it was when we purchased it. Right, but the site plan says something different. That's I'm trying to get an answer to that. They call Why it a grass a parking area. They call it a grass road. But as you drive across grass, it it becomes dirt or mud or packed packed dirt that may look like something. If there's if there's gravel present, then that's a, that's altering the characteristic. That's changes the uh, area that is disturbed. That's my concern here. Um, uh, you're not able to answer that's how you got it sir i'm not yes. you know impugning you in any way it just seems it's, it's inconsistent with what the site plan shows uh did you ever get a copy of this site plan that was signed by the owner saying that they were they were uh, abiding by this and this is what exactly they were going to do uh then the package when we bought the house so we came to the board meeting on july 23rd ashley and i did uh on july 23rd of 2019 and when the board voted that we were in compliance with the site plan of 2015 and 2016. That's, and then we purchased the property right after that. This is a site plan from 2019. This is uh, April 26th. I'm sorry, 2019, July 23rd, 2019 is when we came to the BGA uh, hearing and the, they affirmed that we were in compliance with this. Uh, all the, all the, they, they confirmed we're in compliance with everything. Okay. And that's why we purchased the property. Right. There, there are several versions of this site plan in existence, and some have details like this and some don't. And that's what concerns me here, and I wanted to find out when this uh, gravel was put down. If you look at the picture from approximately 2019 from Redfin, it looks relatively new. We did not put gravel down, sir. Right. You didn't put it down, so the previous owners may have done so. Um, it was certainly, you know, that's, you know, 
it appears to be something like that. Um, I, and I, I can't age gravel, sir. I, I don't know if that was put down by the Fang Myers. I don't know who put it down. Right. It, it was there when you purchased, right? Yes, sir. Right. Okay. That's fair enough. Um, and, and also, sir, the picture, depending on the season, like right now, there'll be a lot more grass over it than there will be by the end of the summer. Right. I would also just remind that we have no idea who took that picture, when that picture was taken. We only know that it was downloaded from the internet at some point in 2019. Right, that's, that's all the, I'm that's saying. That's the best well, information that, that we, we have. It, it, it could have been a year or two before that. We don't. It could have been. It was not taken after 2019. Well. It could have been taken years before right. from aerial photography. We do not know. No, no, but, you know, um, that's just a concern I have is the you know, the letter of the law says be compliant with the site plan, and that doesn't appear to be compliant with the site plan. That's just an observation, but thank you very much for your clarification, sir. Um, on the other items, um, I believe that Mr. Barr Sox already covered it. You, you know, you're using meters that are not calibrated. You're not a sound engineer by training. You have no, you know, acoustics training. Is that correct? That is correct, sir. Right, and the police officers are not qualified to make readings because they're not trained to do so. According to the, you know, appellant um, exhibit nine. Okay, so, all right, I have no further questions. Thank you. Mr. Simmons? No questions. Okay, and just to make it perfectly clear, you've been visited by the sheriff's office in approximately seven of the 30 events that you've had? It's a fair assessment, sir. So almost a quarter of the time. And you have, nev you have not been cited? No, sir. I, when I show them the sound levels and they listen to it, they are very happy and they, they, okay. but they, to, they haven't informed sure me 10 o'clock, it changes. It came from different parts of your testimony. I just wanted to put that together. Yes, sir. Okay. Very good. Um, Mr. Kephart, would you like to call another witness? It's a final witness that I'm sure will be brief. Um, I believe actually some of the exhibits that I intended to introduce with respect to this witness um, were introduced by um, Ms. Hicks, but I would call um, Linda Leith. Leith? Leith. Um, Linda, could you just state your name, address, and occupation for the record, please? Yes, good afternoon. My name is Linda Leith, L-E-I-T-H. My address is 431 Fortress Way, Aquaplan, Virginia, and I'm the Assistant Inspector General to the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency in Virginia. Spell for the record your last name again. L-E-I-T-H, as in Tom T. Okay. I, okay, very good. I thought, I, sorry, Mr. Ryan, I thought you were saying Leaf, so when you refer to her, so it's Leaf. Leaf, like Keith, but Leaf. Okay, very good. Okay. Lord's indulgence, as we that, I That's okay. I, I see you're right. putting documents in front of him to make sure there's no objection to you well, entering them into evidence. We, we came to court with some of the, the same exhibits, so we're just making sure not to duplicate anything. Mm -hmm. right, so uh, let, let's go ahead and we'll call, we're going to call a five minute break real quick while you Thank guys you. do Thank that. You. Appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, I do too.
call the BZA meeting back to order. We have concurrence now on what we want to enter into evidence. We do, yes. Um, thank you. So, did I have you say your name, address, and my Yes, I did. Okay. Yeah, so, I'm just going to draw your attention to appellants uh, 7A, B, C, and D. Do you recognize these documents? Yes. Can you identify those for us? Uh, our advertisement on our website. So that's these are, are just printouts of different tabs on, on your website, is that correct? It, that's what it appears to be, yes. And this um, appellant 7A, can you identify which tab this is? Well, there's a bunch of them, search people free. Which, this looks like the overall. Um, so this one. I don't think they're highlighted. Uh, I think this is the overall okay. front page, maybe. About events and rentals. Okay. Uh, events like and, events rentals. and so rentals. So running along the top of mm -hmm. Appellants 7A, you've got this banner tab from your website. Um, correct. So, so A is events and rentals, correct? That's what it appears to be, yes. Yeah. B is? Yes. Uh, it's the wedding. Yes. And then C, can you identify C for us? C would be the, uh, the stay. So this Looks is like a stay. And this is the one that, that we're going to introduce. Can you? I'm sorry, can I, I can't hear you guys. Yeah, yeah. Could you? Could you? Oh, I'm sorry. Could you? Sure. No, no, no. We can hear. You need to get a little bit close to the microphone when you're speaking, sure. Mr. Kephart. Okay. Can you identify what I'm going to introduce as, as again just a supplement to what was already introduced by Ms. Hicks? And I think that's the stay. Okay. Yes. This incident says three. Three. And we will accept that into evidence. <coughs> All right, so moving through those different tabs on your website, these are basically advertising the different types of packages that you offer at the property. Isn't that correct? Correct. Right. Uh, and so you've got a tab for events and rentals. Um, can you describe the, just the different packages that you've got on offer here um, at the, the Royer House? Yes, we do small gatherings. Uh, it could be baby showers, um, bridal showers, um, meetings. Um, we do host meetings, uh, and, they, and we have them priced out by small, medium, or large, and then the time frame. Okay. Um, and then you've got a, a, what appears to be a number of, of wedding packages as well. Can you describe that for the board, please? Correct. The wedding packages could be um, an intimate uh, wedding. Um, we started doing that because of COVID. We noticed the weddings, people prefer them smaller for attendance. So wedding packages include either uh, up to 50 guests. We've had uh, outdoor picnic weddings. Um, uh, they could be up to 100. Uh, our, just different types of events. Uh, we do offer brunch, um, stay, you know, if they want to stay into the rooms. Uh, so there are different types of packages depending on the guest size. And uh, I'm seeing a, a notation on the, the wedding tab though, towards the bottom. There's a little asterisk there that says um, package available May through October. Can you describe why that appears there? Uh, because that's the typical wedding season. Okay. So, do you guys do you guys offer weddings during the off season ever? Um, we've had requests for indoor uh, for uh, four people, you know, that someone wanted to get married, uh, but we didn't. We've had requests, but we haven't had a wedding. Okay, and, and then with respect to the the stay tab, what what constitutes that? Uh, if they if the um, a lot of wedding couples will have uh, family come in from out of town so we'll rent the rooms um, though we rent the cabin as a, a honeymoon suite um, there they can stay some people come in the week before uh, during uh, seasons we offer it for like we said skiers or uh, families um, Christmas uh, family gatherings um, and it's used as a country and for that. So, so the rentals um, are available on a, a year-round basis. There's no Correct. high season for rentals. Correct. Okay. And do you, in fact, rent them year-round? We do. Mm -hmm. 
And um, Mr. Ryan testified that it was your daughter that was residing on the property, is that correct? Yes, my daughter and her son went there. And, and what is your daughter's role? She's the manager. Um, I was going to be the manager as well, but then with COVID that hit, um, I haven't retired. This was going to be my retirement business. Uh, but my daughter now is the manager. She um, meets and greets and she does the showings and um, she takes the phone calls, she does the websites, um, but I'm involved with everything. Okay, and does your daughter take any role in the um, events or weddings? Yes. And what is her role there? Uh, she's the coordinator, the day of coordinator. She's the, she helps all of the uh, wedding planning with the brides. Um, if there's a meeting or um, uh, one, of, one of the rooms is uh, rented out or if the house is rented out, she coordinates all of that. Okay. Um, and so she would have been counted amongst the, I think we came out to somewhere between seven to 12 employees Correct. that Correct. you guys employ. Yes. Okay. Uh, aside from your employees, I imagine that you guys also have dealings with a, a number of um, different types of vendors in, in this type of business, isn't that correct? Yes. Yes, we have preferred vendors. And can you describe for the board um, what that means, that you have a list of preferred vendors and, and what that means for your business? Um, we have a preferred uh, with florist, um, catering, um, bakery. Uh, we want to keep it within the Carroll County um, um, business to provide back to the community, and that's why we have a preferred list. Um, So the, the patrons that come in to, to host or, or to have events, weddings, rentals, are, are these mostly um, Maryland residents? Where, where are these people coming from? Some, um, some are uh, from Washington, New Jersey, um, from all over actually. They come in, um, some are from the uh, um, surrounding areas, but mostly from out of town. A lot of uh, people have, uh, heard, um, have been to a wedding or an event there, um, so it's a lot of uh, word, by, word of mouth. Um, also, our, our five-star rating has helped um, bring business in as well. Could you say more about your five-star rating? Who, who, yes. who, who gives that rating? How do you get that? What, what does that mean? Uh, the, the wedding couples, uh, the people that stay there, we provide an opportunity for them to rate us. and. And actually, ever since we've um, operated as a country and we've had a perfect five star, my goal is to continue that. Um, I'm very particular about uh, cleaning and um, having the property um, perfect because I want it to be an experience for them to come to the country, the country in, um, take you know the beauty of the Carroll County uh, area in. in. In the main house in the log cabin, we have uh, brochures of uh, the Carroll County Museum. I mean, you, we just advertise Carroll County. Um, we also have other brochures about Gettysburg. So it's an experience when they come to um, our, our inn. Um, so are you aware that as part of the regulatory definition of a country inn that um, it says any dwelling in which rooms are rented to paying guests on an overnight basis with meals served daily? You aware of that? Yes. Okay. And you, you are indeed renting rooms to paying guests on an overnight basis? Yes. Um, do you serve meals? We do. Uh, and what kind of meals do you serve your guests? Mostly um, breakfast and brunch because when people are there, they like to um, take off for the day to explore, you know, around uh, Gettysburg, Carroll County. They'll go out. So it's mostly um, breakfast or brunch. Uh, we provide snacks uh, in, the, in the homes, both homes we provide snacks, pretzels, uh, complimentary snacks. And you, you may have already spoken to some of this, but the, the definition also says a, a country inn may also provide catering and facilities for banquets, weddings, receptions, reunions, and similar one-time events which are not open to the public generally. Um, can you give the board a sense of, other than weddings and receptions, what other kinds of events um, that you uh, host there at the Royal House? We've had, uh, like I said, bridal showers, baby showers, uh, birthday parties, Christmas parties, um, meetings. Um, yeah, the, the Carroll County Riding Club um, has been there. They've had their um, 
their yearly Christmas party there uh, because they the, they have their hounds outside and they they go out on the, the hunt. It's actually pretty cool. Yeah, my, my mother is actually a uh, has been a part of the fox hunting group yes. in Carroll County as well. So that so, strikes uh, close to home. Um, so the <clears throat> Can you give the board a sense of the um, occupancy for um, uh, one-time events other than weddings and receptions? One-time events, uh, right. they would book the room, uh, one room, two rooms, uh, maybe for a night or two nights. Um, um, for a weekend, a lot of weekends. They'll book for um, a long weekend just to tour Cower County. Uh, like I said, most of the people that come are from out of state. They want to, uh, you know, tour um, Maryland. Um, so it's a large part of this case is featuring uh, Miss, or the Hicks complaint about noise. Um, have you ever had any encounters with law enforcement, police, or anyone else complaining about noise yes uh, last year um, last wedding season uh, we had the police come to say that they had complaint and they told me by the Hicks and they were out there uh, we were never cited and I uh, and actually the last time they came out um, I w was getting pretty upset by the, the them coming out because it's disruptive to the bride and groom they're upset thinking they've done something wrong. Why is the police there? I mean, they take pride in their family being there. So if you have the police there, it means that something's wrong. They don't know that someone's called about the noise. So we try to spare them of that and uh, deal with the police ourselves. And it's and it, like Bob had said, it's always um, there's a complaint. They're coming out to investigate it. But And they've been very nice. We've talked to them. Uh, they said that uh, from the road they couldn't hear any of the noise, barely could they hear the noise, and that it wasn't loud. So we were never sighted. We would talk to them, and then they would leave. Um, uh, have you had complaints from any other um, adjacent homeowners or any other members of the public with respect to your operation? No. No, not that I'm aware of. Board's indulgence for a moment. Further. Mr. Bowersox, yes. questions of Ms. Leith's testimony. May I see exhibits 7C and 7D? Uh, 7B. I don't have a C. Over there, Mr. Dixon. And B. C and B. Oh, C and B. A and B, 7A and B? I've got a 7B and a 7A. That's what he's looking for. Thank you. Is Leith just a second? I'm sorry? I just a second and I'll be with you. Um. I'm going to show you a copy of what's been introduced as Exhibit 7C. So I'm just trying to clarify. Your daughter 
Ashley lives on the property? Correct. All right. On the fourth page, I think, <coughs> of the package of 7B, you'll see about halfway down, hosted by Ashley, joined in November 2015. Do you see that part of it? These aren't numbered, I'm sorry. What? No, they, there, there was the fourth page in the package. Fourth page, this is the fourth page. Oh, host uh, joined in November, correct, I see okay. that. And, and underneath, during your stay, could you read what that says? We are a wedding venue, so you might see me, Ashley, giving a tour to a potential wedding couple during your stay. We won't bother you. You just might see us walking around the property looking at the tent and ceremony sites. I'm not always on the property, but I am close by if you need anything. Okay. And your daughter's name is Ashley Savina? Sabina? Sabina, S-A-B-I-N-A. Okay. Do you know who owns 1748 Gable Hammer Road? We do. You do? Bob and I do. Yes, correct. And is that where Ashley lives with you? No. She stays there occasionally when we're there on weekends. And is her address... 1748 Gable Hammer Road? No, her address is 817 Brightinger Mill Road. So if we were to do a search for Ashley and it showed up as 1748 Gable Hammer Road, would that be accurate? No, uh, I, she may get some mail there, I don't know. But her driver's license is 817 Brightinger Mill Road. When we first bought brought the property and we, my daughter moved from Florida to the Gable Hammer until we bought the property um, at 817 Brightinger Mill Road. Okay. So her and her um, fiance at the time lived at 1748 until we moved in there. All right. And when did you buy 1748? Um, 45 days before. 40, uh, before the, uh, yeah, 45 days before the, um, Right in your mill road. In June, July? Uh, it was in July. July. Which the that house is uh, probably about six minutes away from. I'm familiar with it. My. You all bought a, a neighbor of my parents' old house. Mm. I have no other questions. Board members, questions of Ms. Leith's testimony? No questions. I do. Go ahead. Uh, Ms. Leith, um, before you bought this property, did you have a business plan uh, developed to figure out if it was cost effective to buy the property? Before we bought the the, um, the wedding venue, yes, uh, we yes we did have a business plan, but we modeled it after um, the, um, Jen and Mark. Um, I can't remember now. Their last name. Snyder's. Snyder's. We um, we actually before we purchased anything, we jo uh, what, what I call job shadowed them. We worked with them throughout the summer, um, uh, spring and summer, to see if this is what we wanted to do. So. We just volunteered our time. Uh, we were there working with them. I wanted to see all aspects of um, their business model because they did have a good rating as well. I had always wanted a country in. Um, I've taken it a little bit further than what she has because I do enjoy the, the country in part. Um, so we did, we modeled them before we did go uh, to, to decide permanently that we wanted to take on this business venture. Okay. Next question is about the number of uh, guests. Your website says 200 guests. Up to. Up correct. to 200 guests. Up to. The site plan says 200 people, which includes, therefore, uh, the uh, operating staff, car attendants, caterers, band, whatever's there, uh, limits you to 200 physical people. So. You, uh, I don't know if this is an issue for you. It may not be an issue at this point, but it might be an issue at some point where you're advertising to 200 guests and you can't accommodate 200 guests per the site plan. 
Okay. And you understand we haven't, that difference? We, we haven't had 200 guests. We haven't yeah. had 200 guests. Okay. Fair enough. Thank you very point. much. Thank you. Mr. Simmons? Not at all. No questions from me. Okay. Any further witnesses? I'd like to call Mrs. Hicks in rebuttal. Okay. Mrs. Hicks, um, you're still under oath. Yes. Do you, you were here and you heard the testimony of both Mr. Ryan and Mr. Snyder, did you not? Yes. All right. And they talked about decibel readings um, from the sounding like the edge of your property. Did, did you hear that? I heard them say that, okay. that it was at the bottom of our property on the, down the side. Do you have any evidence of decibel readings that were greater than what they've represented? Yes. And what is that evidence? I have a video on my phone that's time stamped that shows um, the rating from August of 2017, and August 19th of 2017. What time was that? 9.44 p.m. And what is a decibel reading? Uh, it's 74.4. All right, and how did you take that measurement? I took it with the, um, the sheriff's office years ago, um, allowed residents to sign out um, the decibel meeting, reader meetings, and they showed me how to use it. And decibel meter readings, I don't think I said that right. Um, and they showed me how to use it. At the time I signed it out, I took it home, and I took the decibel reading from my porch. And those were the calibrated units that they used to have available? Yes. Okay. That was what date? August 19th of 2017. That's just one example. I mean, there I got, I had gotten the meters several different times. All right, can you give us some other representative? I didn't pull that up. It might take me a few minutes, but um, I would have to say if we go with that one because I don't think I'll be able to find it fast enough. I had looked up for it a while ago while we were here. Uh, I can try. It was all around the same time, so. May I ask, was that an unusually loud evening or was that representative? That was representative, which is what caused me to go get the meter to hopefully finally put an end to it because it's just awful. What do you perceive? when the noise is at the level you're talking about? Um, it vibrates, we can't, when we're outside, it yeah. vibrates, like you can feel it pulsing in your abdomen. Um, inside of our house, we can hear it, the thumping of bass throughout our entire upstairs, or we only have a rancher, so the upstairs is the only livable space, everything else is unfinished. Um, I hear the bass thumping in my pillow all the time when you try to take an evening nap go to bed early the face is audible in my pillow and i have been living with this for six years and we hear it over we have a floor fan in our bedroom that is on all the time we have a television that we watch sometimes in there and it's just impossible and we just have resorted to leaving we can't enjoy our house we can't but we've talked for the last six years about moving but who do we move? Where do we go? Sorry. This has just been an experience like no other. The side of your house that faces the Royer house, is that a lot of glass? Part of it is, yes. And I, yes, yeah, so the back section of our house has big plate glass windows that used to look out onto all of the ag preserve which was our most wonderful favorite thing about when we bought the house we had the view of that land that was in preservation and because the trees were never put in we took it upon ourselves to put our own trees in and now that view is blocked and it also cost us ten thousand dollars because of someone else's choices and this has cost us a lot of money and a lot of lost memories and years because of other people's choices and i just want to come up with a reasonable resolution so that i could live and have my life back i'm sorry you don't look for any 
more of the decibel readings. <laughs> Does the board want to see the reading? I mean, I can it was, offer. It was testified to what it was. Yes. And we'll take it as if testimony. If you want more, okay. I have no other questions. Mr. Kephart. Ms. Hicks, you testified that you <clears throat> received those decibel meters from the Carroll County Sheriff's Department in 2017. Isn't correct. that correct? Correct. Um, and I believe you also answered that these um, meters were calibrated. Isn't that correct? Yes. How do you know that they were calibrated? Because they were offered to me as such, as a tool to use to take recordings. So did the Sheriff's Office tell you that they were calibrated? I don't recall they were offered as appropriate equipment to remedy a situation. So you have no other documentary evidence, a, a report showing there's, the latest there's calibration or something like that? There's a report that would have been filled out that I signed to sign it out for the week, and I'm sure that there's paperwork within the sheriff's office that would answer that question. I don't have that. Did what you signed show latest calibration date? I did not have reason to pay attention. I took them at their word as to what okay. they were offering. Um, do you have any sort of training in acoustic engineering or sound engineering? Uh, only what I was, the instruction I was given by the Sheriff's Department. What instruction were you given by the Sheriff's Department? On how to use the meter and how to set it. Do you recall how to use the meter and set it? I have not used it in five years, so no, I would need a refresher. Uh, the, forgive me, I, I don't have the exhibit in front of me, so I don't have the number, but the, the the letter from Sheriff De, Sheriff DeWeese. Do you have uh -huh. that available? I don't have. I don't. I've probably sure seen it, but I think. I don't think. I can't. Got a copy of that. Does the board have a? Yes, it's Exhibit Nine, Appellate Exhibit Nine. July 22nd, 2019. Can I just take a brief look at that? Sure. All right, so this letter dated 2019 says the Sheriff's Office does not currently have noise meters that are properly calibrated, correct? I don't, I've not seen, I don't know what the letter is. I'd have to see it to see what you're saying. Yes, that's correct. And it also, is, it also says that the sheriffs at that time, 2019, were not trained to operate those meters. Oh, I get, I'll have to see it again. I didn't read that line. Yes, I see that. Do you have anything showing that uh, there were sheriffs that at that time in 2017, when you received a meter from them, they were trained to correctly operate and calibrate the meters that you were given? Just that they were advertised on their website at that time to be available to the public and the conversations that I had with the person showing me how to use it. I didn't think it would be necessary to ask for certifications. As, uh, there would be no reason for me to ask for that. Sure. So in 2017, when you took your reading, did you share that reading with the Sheriff's Department? I don't recall. There was a lot of information gathering going on because this has been a full-time job. What was so. what was your intent when you took that reading? When to document you... for ongoing problems. Okay. And did you plan on reporting those problems to the police at any point? I have reported those problems to the police multiple times. But you did not show the reading that you took with the meter that you received from the sheriff's office to the sheriff's office? I don't recall what, I mean, it's been five years, four and a half years ago. I mean, I've had multiple conversations with them. So I would imagine I conveyed it, but I can't tell you in all honesty, I'm not gonna be dishonest, I sure. don't know. Sure, sure. Um, so did anything ever come of the reading that you took uh, in 2017? Not specifically that, no. Uh, no further questions. Board members, any questions? Okay, seeing none, are there any more witnesses? None. None. Okay. 
presentation of testimony and evidence is now closed in summations or order. The applicant is first, well, actually it's the appellant, and uh, then interested parties followed by the appellant's rebuttal. Mr. Bowersox. Thank you. Any conditional use is granted by this board and frankly any principal permitted use in any district shall be subject to a site plan review by all applicable review agencies as determined by the director of the Department of Planning. It's section 155-059A1 <coughs> of the code. Interestingly, when I went and checked chapter 155, there is no provision in that chapter for a simplified site plan. In the zoning code, section 158.133 E7 says, if evidence is offered during the hearing, and for our frame of reference, the hearing was the March 2015 hearing in which, in which 5822 was approved. And if evidence not limited to a formal site plan, evidence is offered during the hearing concerning site plans, site or building locations, or any plans of construction, which are not included as part of the application for a building permit zoning certificate. And they were not. The application for building, zoning, building permit zoning certificate would be the site plan. Those plans shall be incorporated in the application. And no change shall be made in the plans presented to the BZA without the approval of the BZA. The BZA shall not approve a substantial change in the plans unless a hearing is held. In 2015, you were presented an application by the Snyders. I don't think they were out to defraud the board. I don't think they came in here figuring, let's get the camel snows under the tent. I don't think they came in here with any motivation such as that. I think the innocently, and let's assume this is the case, came in here, they had an idea for something they'd like to do, but they had admittedly had not thought it all the way through. They'd never done it before. I know I can empathize with them if I'm embarking on a venture that's new to me, um, and I assume you can too. You heard about a use that they wanted to make. You saw plans associated with their application portraying the property that was there. They said they had ideas for how they wanted this to work and how they wanted it to, to be developed. Their testimony was very scant. Again, I'm not saying that in, in an effort to impugn anyone, but they did them, in my opinion, they did themselves no favors by, me, by not being more forthright is probably not the right word, but more forthcoming with the complete idea for what they wanted to do on the site. Why is that important? As the Court of Special Appeals told us in February, your decisions are only as strong or good as your findings. I'm paraphrasing. The findings of fact that they're based on. You can't make findings of fact on, on various issues if you're not presented those facts. There was absolutely nothing in the record about the use of amplified music. The record, when you go through the testimony, it, this sounds like a wonderful 
little small scale operation, country in, this is great. And we might have some weddings and maybe a reception. No testimony about 200 guests. There was some testimony about maybe up to 100 guests. No testimony about any other construction. There, there was a, a sketch given to you that showed a gazebo. You had to go on what you saw at that point in time. I suspect, and this is why the findings of fact in the decision from 2015 and the lack of them are important, is that if you were to hear a case or your predecessors were to hear a case in 2015 that covered the breadth of what has been discussed here today, this board would have been mindful about conditions to impose on that use to protect the neighbors. Noise. Make sure there's a, an appropriate site plan done other features, construction. I'm not blaming your predecessors for not conditioning it. There was nothing in the record to logically lead them to think that there was any need to condition anything. That's why section 158.133 E7 exists. If you grant an approval for something about which there is, say it's a contractor's equipment storage facility. I want a contractor's equipment storage facility. I've got less, than, you know, I've got one acre or half an acre and I want to put my building here and I'm going to store a couple of trucks outside. That's one thing. I get the approval. If I increase it to three quarters of an acre, if I start storing material, if I'm a landscaper and I start to bring in other goods under the guise of a approved contractor's equipment storage facility that may have more egregious impacts on the neighbors, you've never had an opportunity to vet that actual impact. So what 158.133 D7 says, is that if evidence offered during the hearing concerning site plans, building locations, or plans of construction, those and, and, and that are not included as part of an application for a building permit zoning certificate, where there is a variance, the plans have to be incorporated in the application. And no substantial change shall be made in the plans presented to the board in the application that you heard without your approval. This is not, I'm not going to be an apologist for it, this is not necessarily elegantly or artfully drafted, but this is the only logical conclusion that can be drawn from the language of this section. The site plan talks about a number of events at 20. Event times, uh, late April to, er, to later October, and that's, that's not necessarily inconsistent with what they've mentioned in connection with the events, the accessory use. Maximum occupancy during the event, 200 people, that's really different. Mrs. Snyder admitted that in addition to the 100 person figure that was discussed directly with the board, the only other figure specifically that was brought up was 75. The, the appellees will say, well, there's evidence that it could change. Well, the only evidence was that it could change in a downward direction. Grass access drives. Mr. Caldwell uh, has, has questioned that. Th this is a 
a bit of a problem inherent in the site plan itself. In the general notes, you may recall that when that plan's being reviewed with these grass access drives, they're not being reviewed as if any of those access drives are areas that have been improved. And it's 4,998 square feet area of disturbance. And again, we suspect there's at least two square feet in that driveway location. Given the scale of what's shown there, it would look like the straight run, at least in terms of measuring distances that way. If that um, proposed or existing tent area is 80 feet, 90 feet, it looks like it's just shy of 200 feet, the straight run back the parking area. Note B, unless owner occupied, the manager must reside on the premises. It's just a statement of a condition that's a statutory condition for operating a country inn, not a wedding venue, a country inn. There's testimony presently that the daughter of Mrs. Leith resides on the property. There's indications that she may not. There was testimony that she resides at home with us. So that again becomes somewhat open. It's we just don't know. Um, Amplified music was never discussed. Weddings uh, were to uh, be initially outdoors, events, uh, and there was a discussion in the record, we've been through it, that there was no reason for it to come up and no reason for neighbors to be concerned. There is absolutely no mention of amplified music in your decision in case 5822. None. Why? It never came up. There's no testimony of an intention to play amplified music. The applicants here today say, well, sure, we always did this. We just assumed everybody knows this. And, um, you know, is that a significant impact from this use? Apparently, under current operations, we've heard that there's been visits from the, from the sheriff's office seven out of 30 times. And it had been going on before then. It, it, a lot of effort is going into mitigating that feature from the property. If that's not a significant part of the activity that you are being requested to view, and its presence not a substantial deviation from what you had in the record before you to be included on a site plan, then you ha there's no way you can dis discharge your statutory and case law duty under Schultz versus Pritz, which I'm not going to bore you with because you probably have learned more about it than you ever wanted to. Um, you can't do it. How can you how can you gauge at the adversity of an impact if you never if you don't know what the impacts are? Um, I suspect you guys are talented, but I don't know if any of you are mind readers. Um, landscape screening in the vicinity of the pavilion. The materials that were submitted as part of the application, you've seen them. They, they depict a, the row of pine trees. There was a discussion uh, in, the discu in the transcript and in the decision about mature 40-foot pine trees or words to that effect. And that was done with some assurance that uh, it would shield the neighbors uh, from some impacts from this use. 
And it looked like from the submission that was part of the application, like it was on the Royer House property. They're not. Those are trees that have been limbed up. Some of them are gone. I don't know if you noticed that when you were out there or not. But a lot of the low story has been eliminated. That was a detail that was not included in what you heard in March of 2015. And it's, it's a substantial difference from what's shown on the plan, that the trees were not on the applicant's property, they're on a neighbor's property. Hours of operation. There was a specific request for hours and days of operation in 2015. And the specific answer was, I'm paraphrasing, nobody's getting married before noon. So noon to maybe five. And if they want a reception, we'll do something later. There was no discussion of four to eight, excuse me, four to 10, as shown on the site plan. Would you have approved the use in 2015 if you'd known these details, at least without conditioning it? I think not. But you, we won't know unless we, we look at the relief that's available from 158.133 that we've discussed. The decision says noon to five. Apparently, the board didn't catch the same nuance that the applicants anticipated you would in terms of hours of operation extending till 10 o'clock. It's because they weren't, they weren't there. Why not be forthcoming? If it's because of an honest mistake, it's an honest mistake. Then file an application, come back in front of the board, say our operation is different than what we represented to you earlier. Here is what we want to be able to do. I've done a number of those cases in front of some on this board and prior boards. It's not unheard of. The discussion about the number of people, some things came up in testimony and trying to justify uh, or, you know, like, well, you know, we didn't, we didn't tell you there wouldn't be anyone outside at receptions. And um, at page 26, there was a discussion about, uh, with the rooms to rent discussion, I think with uh, Mr. Kramer or Mr. Tiegler, they had room for people on the inside of a hundred inside the building of a hundred a hundred maximum occupancy well we didn't say we wouldn't have more outside well why not just say it that's that's the troubling part of this hours could change the discussion at page 26 might have somebody there, the suggestion was made by Mr. Kramer. So you may change the hours and somebody may have to be there at nine o'clock to do catering and set up and everything else. Yes, that's right, it could happen that way. But there was no suggestion of it going the other direction.
There was some discussion about Steve Hicks talking about uh, his fears for what could happen. Um, they downplayed their direct response to him in the transcript. That was put before you as a claim that Mr. Hicks knew exactly what was going on, or at least he was anticipating the problem, but they downplayed their response. His question is not their testimony. As Mr. Snyder from the board brought out, the tent is an item that requires a building permit, a building permit annually. A structure requiring a building permit that appears after you render a decision when you've heard nothing about any proposed building like that, and nothing is shown in the application that's before you at the time, we submit as a substantial change with regard to construction plans. It was not shown. You could not have considered it. When does a tent first appear on one of the original, one of the earlier site plans? I think uh, one of the members of your panel indicated that the date of that plan was August, um, perhaps of uh, 2015. Um, so that would have been something long after you saw the sketches and heard the testimony, which didn't include anything about a tent in March of 2015. When we hear about the amount of effort being expended to monitor and mitigate the impacts from an accessory use, not even the dominant use of the property allegedly, it's clear that that is a substantial aspect of the accessory use, the event facility. You had no idea about it at the time. There was nothing in the record about amplified music. We submit that that is a substantial change that deals with a particular aspect that you're supposed to consider in resolving conditional uses, that is noise. It's been ongoing, it's clear it continues to be ongoing. There's 12 employees, three for the country in, nine for the accessory use. 30 to 40% of the income comes from the primary use. 70 to 60 percent goes to the accessory use. The incidental subordinate customary use that the dominant use is supposed to justify. We think it's clear that the infer that what was presented to this board in 2015 in terms of the application that was submitted, the evidence that was submitted is radically different than what this project has evolved into. But more importantly, is substantially different than the site plan, which is supposed to implement your decision allowing a conditional use on the site. 
So we are requesting that you, you grant the appeal of the Hicks challenge to the Bureau of Development Review's determination that there's no substantial change directed to go back to them and presumably the applicants are going to have to come back into you with an application to amend their existing conditional use to reflect what's going on there according to the code. Thank you. Okay, hey, Mr. Kephart. Sure. <clears throat> so as Mr. Bowersox has, has correctly stated, the, the proper standard here is substantial change and whether or not substantial change exists between the testimony and the application that was provided to you in 2015 and the site plan as it exists here today as approved by the county in 2019. They have identified uh, a few things that they believe constitute that substantial change and I will try to tackle them uh, each in order as best I can. Uh, one of those substantial changes that has been much talked about today is the use of amplified music. And I'll grant that the word music or amplified, amplification, none of those words appear in the testimony before the board in 2015. What does appear, however, are the words function, reception, wedding, uh, all of these different types of events. Uh, and I think the, the common sense feeling amongst most of those that testified here today and that is also shared by council, uh, frankly, is that music is a part of any wedding that I have ever been to, aside from my own, and that's only because I got married here at the Carroll County Courthouse during the height of COVID, and they didn't, you know, you can't bring your Bluetooth speaker out there. Congratulations. <laughs> um, thank you. So, now, does the use of amplified music or music generally at um, what was admittedly represented to the board as uh, an event venue that would host weddings and receptions? Does amplified music constitute a substantial change? I don't believe that it does. As I said, I think that the common sense notion about what occurs at a wedding, a reception, or a party, uh, especially of the size that we are, are talking about, um, and that was testified to before the 2015 board. Um, honestly, I, I think that that was a, a fair and reasonable assumption to make that amplified music or music generally would be included in those events. I think that that's, I don't think that that's controversial whatsoever. And I have put on ample testimony today reflecting my clients previous and ongoing efforts to minimize the impacts of that sound. I have also put on evidence that the Hicks are the only individuals complaining about that sound. We haven't received any other noise complaints from any other parties. Uh, the, neither the Snyders nor um, Mr. Ryan and Ms. Ms. Leith have ever been cited for any violation of the Carroll County Noise Ordinance. Now, I know that there's now that 2019 letter from Sheriff DeWeese that, you know, maybe there's an issue in the enforcement ability. Um, however, Ms. Hicks testified that there was a time where meters were available and that police, I'm assuming if meters were available, they were renting them out to the public, that it was possibly enforceable at that time and at no time have my clients ever been held in violation of any noise ordinance or law. Uh, nevertheless, they continue a, a, I think, a very vigilant regime in terms of 
policing the sound that is emanating from the property, right? You've got a, a person, an employee there dedicated every single event, taking readings. We heard readings were being taken between every half an hour to every hour at every single event. And they are purposefully holding themselves to the most restrictive standard that the law supplies us with. I can't think of any more guidance that or efforts that they could possibly do. They've brought in experts, right? DJs, people that play music for a living and understand how the waves emanate from the property in order to help them with this. They have designed their event space in such a way to minimize the effects of that noise amplification. Uh, there was uh, some discussion as to the uh, maximum occupancy. Now, the specific testimony was 100 people was the maximum occupancy of the, uh, the inside of the building. However, there was also a suggestion that they would hold events outside and that they would have operating or, or working at those events as many people as would be needed for the size of the event that they were holding. Uh, <clears throat> my clients have testified that they have never frankly come close to that 200 limit. I think the highest number was somewhere between 130 or 150 maybe tops. Um, and since um, the Christian Royer House LLC is taking over that property, they haven't come anywhere, anywhere close to that figure. Uh, the tent issue. Uh, again, the word tent does not appear in the transcript. Um, there's testimony from Ms. Snyder that she recalls uh, there being some discussion about outdoor facilities and a discussion as to there would not be a, a, a new construction, right? We can't build a building. We don't want to do that on this property. It's historic. Uh, <clears throat> there's discussion about a, a gazebo, an arbor. There's discussion about a pavilion. Um, so it, clearly there was an express representation to the board in 2015 of my client's intent to use some sort of outside facility in order to uh, put on the types of events that they wanted to put on. Uh, there was a, a very brief dis, uh indication from Mr. Bowersox that the current manager, Sarah, Ms. Lee's daughter, may not live on the property. Ashley. Ashley, I'm sorry. Ashley. I don't know where he got that from. I don't see any evidence of that in the testimony or the evidence that was presented here today. All I heard was testimony from both of my clients that Ashley lives on that property, that she's the one there every single day. Uh, so I, I don't know where that came from, frankly, and I don't think that it's a substantial change. Uh, there was another suggestion that the screening was somehow inappropriate, uh, inappropriate um, limbed up trees. Uh, there was testimony from the Snyders as well as uh, Mr. Ryan and, and Ms. Leith that although that original drawing um, showed the trees on the property. They, they, the pine trees actually are off, sort of, you can see on the site plan, it looks like one or maybe two of them might be within the bounds of the property, but then it sort of curves out and around. Um, but there was testimony from the Snyders and um, my clients here today that they had permission from the Lippies, the property owners, to to trim those trees and to, to deal with them as they saw fit. And they did so, um, not in a reckless manner, um, but they hired a professional arborist who gave them the recommendation to trim those trees. And they did it for the health of the tree, right? I 
presume, I'm not an expert, but when an arborist gives such a recommendation, I'm assuming that it's to preserve the health of that tree. If you don't continue with the upkeep, then you create a bigger problem, right? You, you sacrifice the health of the whole tree. Uh, so I, I don't see, I don't see any legs on that theory either. Uh, there was a suggestion that the hours of operation might constitute a substantial change. I, I don't see that in the testimony before 2015 <coughs> either, frankly. We have direct testimony from Ms. Snyder that weddings would occur somewhere between noon and five, um, and that receptions could occur after that. Uh, so. It, depending on right the amount of guests and the length of each event wedding versus reception you can easily get up into 10 o'clock as reflected in the site plan approved uh, by the county uh, I have a note regarding the um, grass access drive versus gravel. Um, it, all of the evidence suggests that that is essentially a, a misnomer or a, a scrivener's error almost, that that's grass. All the testimony here today has been that that's a, a gravel driveway and that it was existing at the time that my clients purchased the property. So there's been no further disturbance of the property as it existed from when it was purchased, which is reflected on the site plan. I think I have now covered all of the issues that were identified by the Hicks as potential substantial changes, um, and I, I don't, I don't think the burden has been met on any of them. And I think that my clients have again in, implemented a program of. Uh, vigilant uh, and, 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 f and been forthcoming in terms of minimizing the potential effects of their operation. They have created a, what appears to be a very profitable, a very sustainable, a very attractive business. We heard testimony that they employ their entire family in this business, that they work with and promote for local vendors in the community uh, the the uh, or the appellants, I think, if have have struggled to meet their burden today. I don't. I don't see any reason why the board would now essentially revoke a plan approval um, that was given more or less at the request of development review, um, which modified uh, the note from, right, no no rooms available for rent. That was the proffered reason from Clay Black that the, the, the 2019 plan was necessary. Uh, I think that my clients have operated their business within the boundaries um, and, and within the uh, testimony as reflected in the transcript before the 2015 board. Um, and I think that they have done 
everything, every effort. I think they've bent over backwards um, in order to minimize exactly the types of things that the Hicks today are, are complaining about. And with that, I'll submit. Mr. Bowersox, would you like a redirect conclu uh, concluding comments or no? There was a, a reply, I should say. I, I will say no. No, I won't. Okay. The presentation of testimony is now closed and summations are in order. Oh, wait. The hearing and record, of the, I was on the wrong line. The record and hearing of this case is now closed and in accordance with the Open Meetings Act, the board will now consider the case. Mr. Snyder. What well, I know you were going to ask me. <laughs> you, drew the, you drew the short stick. Oh, gosh. Long day, and thanks, everyone, for being here. Um, it's been a long day for everyone. Um, I do appreciate all the testimony. Um, if I understand correctly, and I've checked this with counsel, that what we're dealing with is an appeal of the site plan in that it does not conform with the decision of the board of April 6, 26th, 2015, which is my anniversary, by the way. Not, not the 15th, of course, but yesterday was my anniversary. Anyway, um, I've read the testimony. I've seen the, seen the video of the testimony of 2015. I've heard the testimony here today. And I think based on all that, I have a relatively good understanding of what, what is occurring. Um, I would start by saying transparency and full disclosure at a hearing is so critical. And just because the question's not asked doesn't mean it should not be answered. Meaning that the intent when an applicant comes to the board is to be completely transparent to the best of their ability. Yes, things slip through, things are not mentioned, questions aren't asked, it happens all the time, it happens now, but it's not my role to second guess the prior board and their deliberations. But testimony was vague. And doing so, it makes things very difficult for everyone reviewing the record. However, assuming the question wasn't asked and the specific question wasn't answered, cannot be assumed that the board would not, that that would impact the board's ultimate decision. Meaning the fact that there would be a tent, the fact that the number would be 200, whatever the case may be, you can presume one way that they would not have approved it, and you can equally presume the other way that they would. And I cannot stand in uh, judgment of what was assumed and what was not assumed in the 2015 hearing by that board. Moreover, based on my understanding of why we're here today, compliance with the site plan is not really of issue here. There's, there's recourse if there is not compliance to the current site plan. Same as far as noise issues. There's remedies, there's law enforcement, and so forth if that is an issue. It does not, it's not really germane to what I understand we're here to decide today. Whether the, the, the site plan, the final site plan reflects the will and direction of the hearing of the Board of Zoning Appeals on April 26, 2015. And to that end, inasmuch as that board did not see that's needed to put in uh, caveats in their, in their decision of timing, of um, noise monitoring, whatever caveats they cho chose or don't chose, and we put those in our hearings all the time when we feel it's needed, for whatever reason that board did not feel that was a requirement. They felt they had a full understanding of what was being asked and what they were approving. And consequently, since that was not, there was no uh, limitations put in there other than the inclusion of the letter from Mr. Lippy relative to the farming around the area, um, I do not see where the site plan is in conflict with the board's decision at, the, at, at, the, at that level. 
So I would vote not to approve the appeal. Okay, Mr. Caldwell. Well, looking at the information that's being presented to us, uh, there are some things that are just, you know, that really s stick out to me. Uh, uh, Mr. Snyder was on, um, on the record saying, we want to be good neighbors. And, you know, the amplified, uh, amplified noise from the band and so on, to me was disturbing because he's using music levels that are above, the, you know, the recommended threshold uh, at the site. So he's putting his guests in danger of ear damage, albeit they're not they're not in prolonged exposure. But you know, from my experience, uh, music noise level increases directly, and and since this is in decibels, it's a logarithmic scale, but in decibels is directly proportional to the increase in size of the crowd. The music gets louder the bigger the crowd. The, um, they're not upholding any standard for noise level. They're not uh, professional audio engineers. They don't have calibrated equipment. Um, we did hear testimony from um, Ms. Hicks that she did have a calibrated instrument from the police department. I have no uh, doubt that they, the reading was uh, substantially accurate because she was shown how to use it by someone who was trained how to use it and she did obtain a reading why she didn't report it to the police I don't know maybe she did maybe she didn't um, but the original testimony from the Snyders uh, implied that the trees were in their property and therefore were providing you know noise break and so on and so forth which is not true but, you know as I said in the in the hearing that those trees don't belong to them, and Mr. Lippy could, at some point, decide to cut them down. It's entirely his right to do so. So to present that as a benefit in their case was um, disingenuous, I think. Maybe that's not the right word, but I, it felt to me like it was implied that this was a, a great advantage that they were providing these mature pine trees that are not theirs. Um, as far as the grass driveway is concerned, uh, there are a number of site plans out there, and I'm surprised that none of them have come to the board for review because they all, to me, look substantially different. Formal garden is a sizable investment. is substantially different. The, the structured tent, uh, which has a, uh, a permanent structure to it, you know, although they have to you know, get a permit to put the, um, the vinyl cover over, it still has a, a skeleton of structure that's permanent. Uh, the grass driveway appears and disappears from different versions of the site plan. And that, and uh, uh, Mr. Bowersox raised that question about the amount of disturbance being two feet less than the code requirement. It makes me doubt that there's some variation going on here uh, for some reason. I don't like it. It's a, as if the plan was manipulated to make it look right. Uh, that's my impression. That's uh, that I may be uh, incorrect in that, but it does look like that to me. It doesn't look good. Um, the, as uh, Mr. Uh, my esteemed colleague, Mr. Snyder said that this, the testimony was scant. The first three people that were witnesses for the applicant were daughters, and they basically were asked, "Well, what do you do?" And that was it. There was no further. Uh, discussion on what what they were planning to do. Um, the decisions were based only on the facts available at the time, and I think the decision, unfortunately, was in error because there was not sufficient evidence there to make a, a real decision. They should have referred it back and say, "Give us a better understanding." One would think that the Snyders would have some kind of business plan before entering into buying a property like this. It's an expensive uh, proposition. But there was no reference to a business plan. It was very vague, and assumptions were presented to us. I said, well, of course it'll be music. Who's never been to a wedding without music? Well, that's, that to me is it's kind of a flippant way to approach it. Um, noise is a substantial deviation. Uh, suffering that amount of noise at, a, uh, at such high levels is inexcusable. If we're going to be good neighbors, then do something about it. Keep the noise down to... Uh, levels that are permitted by law. This is way too high. Um, the other thing I discovered uh, is that the site plans uh, that are drawn up are actually not visited by the, the development people to verify what they're actually going to build. So it's a free-for-all. So what can start off as something that's vague, 
gets uh, added to and added to and added to, and there's no check on what is actually going to be built or how it affects the neighborhood. And that I find is a, a great weakness. From the, uh, the representatives here, uh, it was said 40% of the income comes from room 60% from the accessory use. As, as they've stated, that primary and secondary uses are in fact reversed. That is a substantial deviation also. Uh, so you know, based on that information that's being presented here, I would be in favor of granting the appeal. Mr. Simmons, you want me to go? Yeah. Oh my. Okay, I'm going to try to be brief, briefer than my colleagues, but I don't think that's going to be possible. <laughs> um, let, let, let's start down here with a simplified site plan. Simplified site plan was put in. A simplified site plan, um, Mr. Bowersox alluded to, isn't, isn't addressed in the code. However, a simplified site plan, uh, according to my recollection, recollection serving on the Planning Commission for too many years, is a substitute for a site plan. So, and the reason it's a substitute is the 5,000 square feet or, or other extenuating circumstances. And a simplified site plan can be signed off by the chairman or the planning director. According to the plan submitted by Carol Land Service, in accordance with the, in, in, in consultation with Clay Black, who was uh, at that time the head of development review, they met that. That's not our standard. Other agencies, other agencies came to that conclusion. So there is a site plan. It's a simplified site plan. Carol Land Service and Clay Black came to that conclusion. The graph paper plan that was uh, representation of what was on the site at the time was not a site plan. Very seldom do we see site plans. We may say we may we may see rough drawings. Uh, they hadn't gotten that far in the process to get anything done professionally. Our role, I say our role, the role of the Board of Zoning Appeals in the original 2015 case was the applicants came forward asking for a wedding venue. A wedding venue is not part of our code. The wedding venue, that's not, that's not in a conditional use in the ag zone. What is, is what is allowed is the, um, the wedding, the wedding, uh, the, the country inn. And you have to have a country inn in order to have a wedding venue. That's how the wedding venue, because wedding venues, when this code was originally written, there were none in Carroll County. There's been an explosion of them. So in order to accommodate them without rewriting the code, a country inn had to be the request in order to have a wedding venue. One of the issues that we get into, is it really a room for rent in that country inn? It was testified here today that that really are rooms for rent in this place. And we had testimony that there is someone that is living on site there at, at this, at this um, and she's the manager uh, on the site. That meets the requirements of the wedding venue slash country inn, country inn slash wedding venue, however you want to put it. Very seldom have we heard that 30 to 40 percent of the income is coming from the country inn. It's usually 90 or 95 percent is coming from the wedding venue and the country inn is basically available if the wedding party wants it. This is actually rented out and it was in testimony, it was in stuff that was uh, handed over to us uh, from the website. So is it being used as a country inn? Absolutely. So all those issues are moot points. I'm a little, we, we can't access the thought process of the 2015 Board of Zoning Appeals even though we have one of those members with us. Um, that was not meant to be a dig. Um, yes it was. <laughs> but, but I can't, I can't believe that they wouldn't think that there wouldn't be music in a, at a wedding venue. Uh, that, 
that's probably one of the things that they all thought. Uh, it wasn't verbalized. It was not in the decision. Um, what we what we also have here is the neighbors were more concerned about the porta pots than what they were the music. I'm a little disappointed in, in Mr. Ed Lippy because he's the one that surveyed this off of the farm that he bought that he didn't go with the tree line that only a couple of the trees are there but if Mr. Lippy says that those trees um, you know are going to stay there I, I he, he was here at that 2015 hearing I'll, I'll take his word for that the site plan is the issue we have a site plan how it was arrived um, was between the applicant, well, the, 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 the 2000, the Snyders, and the, the development, re, development Review Committee, or board. The noise. We heard conflicting testimony. We have a letter here saying the Sheriff's Office can't calibrate the equipment. We had testimony that the meter used was calibrated. We have issues with how many times a wedding. Uh, it it uh, we we checked on the the uh, decibel readings. Um, I don't know. I've never been there for a wedding. I haven't been in the area during a wedding. Um, is that an issue? Um, it probably is, but is, again, Schultz v. Pritz. Is it any greater of an issue, is it more of an issue here than any other place in the ag zone? And I would say no. So is, is noise an issue? Maybe, but using Schultz v. Pritz, is it any greater here than at any other site in the ag zone? And my answer to that is no. The noon to four or five answer about the wedding about the weddings was a wedding question. I think it was by Mr. Kramer. The question of hours of that the reception uh, would go on was never brought up. It wasn't brought up by the residents, it wasn't brought up by the applicant, it wasn't asked by the board. Was that a mistake? Maybe it was, but it was never brought up. Do I think the applicants were um, deceptive? No, it's their first time through the process. And they didn't know. I can remember the first Board of Zoning Appeals meeting that I went to, I was not up sitting up here, and I didn't understand the convoluted process. Um, I can sympathize with being on that side for the first time. So I, I don't see any reason here to grant the appeal when we have a simplified site plan that appears to be uh, adhered to, especially by the people that are sitting here in front of us today. Was it a mistake on there about um, the the uh, what was what was the number of rooms yeah the the number of rooms or, or the no rooms uh, no rooms for rent on the original absolutely that's the premise for getting the wedding venue if you don't have that you can't get the wedding venue venue and for the record that's being worked on right now as we speak so a country in might not be depends what the Planning Commission and the commissioners do, might not be a necessary requirement of a wedding venue in the future. That's what's being discussed. Okay, Mr. Simmons, and don't say that my colleagues have covered all of my points. More adequately than I will, that I guarantee you. Um, I appreciate Mark and I appreciate you, Melvin, and your perception of what's going on so I'm going to be brief uh, I feel like mr. Ryan is that right yes sir and miss Leith 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 Leith, Leith. Leith. Uh, 
deserve to run the inn as is. And I'm going to vote in favor of that. Okay, guys. I can't make a motion as chair according to Robert Rules of Order. If I can find the case number, I'll, I'll do it. 6158. I make a motion in the, in the case of the case 6158, the Board of Zoning Appeals, den the, the Board of Zoning Appeals deny the, ap the appeal. I think that's all you have to say. Second. Okay. So we have a motion to deny the appeal in case number 6158. Any further discussion on the motion? Can we impose any restrictions? No, because the issue before us is an appeal of that the site plan. Site plan. It's yes. a yes or no. The site plan could have restrictions added to it. Not the site plan. No. They're no. appealing that decision. No, no that would that that's development review's responsibility. That's out of our purview. Okay. Thank you for the clarification. That's out of our purview. Okay. Any other questions on the motion? Any discussion on the motion? All those in favor, aye. 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 All opposed, no. No. Motion carries three to one. Our oral decision will become final upon a written decision which will be issued within 30 days unless otherwise extended by the board. The board's decision may be appealed by filing a petition for judicial review with the clerk of the circuit court for Carroll County in accordance with the provisions of Chapter 200, Title 7 of the Maryland Rules of Procedure. The appeal must be filed within 30 days of the date of the board's written decision. Thank you very much, and this hearing is adjourned. <laughs>